The white-haired man asks if the lady offers to sleep in the same bed with a girl who may have come after his soul. He tells Nadia Balazit not to be mistaken, because he will never have anything to do with Balazit's daughter. The guy angrily says this to the lady and then leaves, slamming the door. Nadia tells Glenn to wait. It is difficult and painful for a pampered child to hear such cold words, but for the main character, this is great happiness. She was so happy. The girl thanked the Marquis and asked him to be sure to keep his word. Nadia was an illegitimate child of the Balazit family and had a very private life. The girl's sister took out all her anger and pain on her. The woman constantly mocked and humiliated her. The father constantly told the girl that she was doing all this for the family. The daughter was his puppet, which he used in every way for the sake of the family. Her fiancé had a hand in the death of the main character. Probably God also considered her life pitiful. When the lady opened her eyes again, she returned to one of the days when she was twenty. The girls gave a new, second life. This time, she plans to destroy everyone who brought her to this. Nadia promises herself that she will live only for revenge. To begin with, pretending to be madly in love, she married an old enemy of the Balazit family, the Marcus of Winterfeld from the north. The girl thinks that since she is the daughter of his enemy, of course Glenn could not sincerely fall in love with her. The main character thought that everything turned out as she planned. Now the main character remembers how she walked down the corridor with her fiancé on her arm. The girl twisted her ankle, and the guy helped her get there. The girl was worried about the pain in her leg, but something bothered her more, and that was her husband, who was too close. Nadia's mind replays moments when the Marquis was kind to her. The girl assumes that the guy might have become interested in her. The great long-term war between the kingdom and demons through the efforts of one hero ended in victory for the kingdom. People welcome the savior who put an end to this war, and his name was Li Ji Ho. There is a more beautiful description for him, a warrior from another world, a dragon slayer, and also the groom of an abandoned woman from the Duchy of Balazit. When the girl married Lord Li Ji Ho, she didn't look very happy. Their marriage took place before Li Ji Ho became a hero. This is how the whole tragedy began. Nadia Balazit is the daughter of a concubine from the Balazit family, a puppet. When the girl passed by, she heard gossip. The rest said that they did not understand why they needed this useless garbage. Her relatives said that she was humiliating the dignity of their family. The main character never dreamed that her own father would recognize her, because Nadia was constantly compared to her younger sister, who had been spoiled since childhood. And the servants also treated her with disdain. But suddenly, she had a chance to gain her father's respect. He proposed to his daughter to marry Li Ji Ho. Back then, Li Ji Ho was a mercenary who was called from another world to protect the kingdom. The speed of his development was so fast that it was frightening. Duke Balasith was sure that if he tied him to his daughter, it would definitely work into his hands. So he entered into a fictitious marriage with Nadia, and they both became pawns of Balazit. As they stood together, the main character asked the guy if he was okay. The same one, after a moment of silence, replied that he would definitely succeed, and no one would dare to ignore him. Even though they were forced to marry, Nadia still had hope that one day they would be able to live like an ordinary husband and wife, until she fell into a trap. The golden-haired lady came to the prison cell, she opened the door and asked what happened to her sister. Nadia insisted that there was a misunderstanding and she could explain everything. The girl asks to call Li Ji Ho. The sister apologizes and says that Lord Li Ji Ho will never come. The main character did not understand what her interlocutor was talking about, but she continued to talk. She said that since Nadia first married him, everything has changed dramatically. After all, now he has become the most important person in this country, and his wife cannot be someone like her sister. Karen Balazit is Nadia's half-sister. She asks what kind of misunderstanding, perhaps, and repeats that the girl, apparently, mistakenly thought that she was the one who imprisoned her here. The main character cannot believe it and says that Karin and her father are involved in everything. At first it seemed to her that this was because of her enmity with her stepsister. But the golden-haired lady asked if her sister really thought so. This was a major scandal that spread throughout secular society. The father and his daughter and the hero of the country discussed how to get rid of Nadia. Some of them insisted that there was only one way, to give the girl alcohol at the upcoming banquet. She is usually very cautious, so you need to add medicine to make her intoxicated. After that, 
they planned to place a hired man next to her, and when she woke up, they would call people. The more witnesses, the better. When this happened, people immediately began to make a splash about it. They said that it was very indecent, and it was immediately clear from the girl that she was the daughter of a concubine. They claimed it was shameless. The stepsister asks the main character if she knew that Lord Lee Ji Ho proposed this idea. Come to think of it, after this incident, he never visited Nadia. The girl thought it was because he was disappointed in her, but in fact, he planned everything himself. Even marrying her, the daughter of a concubine, he must have considered discrimination against him. If the Lord had simply offered to divorce, the main character would not have objected because she was a simple brochure and it was rather stupid to hope for something. Her half-sister claims that then his reputation would suffer because he is a hero of the war. Nadia asks if her sister came because she felt sorry for him. Now the guy has become a hero, that's why. Corrine does not allow the girl to finish her sentence and claims that she can say whatever she wants. This is her last chance, because this is all she has left. The golden-haired woman claps her hands and asks who will accept the one who was abandoned by her husband because of a relationship with another man, who might the girl be an illegitimate child and will not be able to marry anyone other than a simple worker. So she will help her sister just once. She says that her father wanted to let her stay, but Nadia decided to commit suicide because of the feeling of shame. Two men attack a girl and try to put her into eternal sleep. The golden-haired lady claims that once the main character's name is tarnished by her shameless act, she will be remembered as a girl who knows the feeling of shame. Nadia thinks she doesn't want to say goodbye to her life. Will she really end up like this? All her life she did as her father said, she was obedient. As a child, she always looked at her stepmother's reaction. She couldn't even breathe without her permission. Stepsister took away all the good things from her, and now the golden-haired lady says goodbye to her sister and says with a rash of fake smiles that she will miss her. In the end, the girl ended her life after living only 23 years. The main character thought that everything would end like this, but when she opened her eyes, she returned to one of the days when she was 20. Nadia noticed that there was no rope around her neck and wondered how she could survive. In her dark consciousness, she definitely felt how the dark end of her life envelops her body, but the girl woke up absolutely healthy in her room, and besides, everyone here looks the same as three years ago. She had another chance. A chance to take revenge on her selfish fiancé, her sister who laughed while she was being killed, and her father who used her and then got rid of her like some kind of trash. The main character stands near the mirror and thinks about what other people would choose if they were given a second chance. Maybe they would like to live for love or live a long time in full health. The girl, after thinking a little, chooses revenge. The maid comes into Nadia's room and says that when she woke up, she should have immediately rung the bell. Because of her brown-haired hair, she could not clean the room. She sees that the girl is touching her reflection in the mirror and says that if she touches the mirror with her hands, stains will remain on it. The maid pushes the main character away and begins to wipe the mirror and angrily reproach her mistress that she doesn't even know something simple. Nadia was worried that this could all be a dream, but the girl really somehow returned to the past. Because this maid was responsible for keeping her room clean before Karen finished her off three years ago. In addition, on the day of the banquet, when the main character was captured, she, on Karen's orders, slipped her alcohol she drank it and lost consciousness. This is too suspicious to be called a coincidence. Then Nadia did not understand that the servant had deceived her into this trap, but now everything is different, and she will not fall for it again. She asked what this facial expression was on her mistress's face, and whether she wanted to tell her something. The brown-haired woman thanks her service for always cleaning her room and tells her what will come out. The maid notices that the atmosphere has somehow changed. When Nadia leaves her room into the corridor, she is greeted by the maid. She claims that His Majesty the King has come to see the Duke, and the lady needs to prepare to meet His Majesty. The main character does not understand why the King visited her father. The girl says it's just in time and she'll be ready soon. Nadia meets her father and claims that he called her. The Duke says that his daughter was very late. The girl says that she was getting ready in a hurry. She understands that her father looks at her as if she were some kind of non-entity. In the past, she was afraid of this look and humbly obeyed, trembling with fear. The father steps further and claims that he will tell everything along the way, 
so she must listen carefully. It will be about the triumphal ceremony. That's why the king came. His daughter and Karen must take care of the tea. Also, the question will arise that she will reward Lord Ji Ho with a laurel crown, and she needs to agree to this. Nadia tells her father that she will do this, and in her thoughts she understands that the king came because of the ceremony on the occasion of the triumph during the Kalai expedition. Holding such ceremonies is a long-standing tradition. In it, a girl of married age places a laurel wreath on the hero, for whose sake the ceremony is being held. In other words, it is a declaration of love. The problem is that one of the people being honored at the ceremony is a northerner, which means he is the South's worst enemy. The girl realizes that this is probably why the king wants to shift the focus to something else, allowing her to present the wreath to Li Ji Ho. They want to bind the Lord to her through marriage. Even if the main character refuses, her father will not listen, but she needs a chance to free herself from her father and Li Ji Ho. The duke and his daughter enter the room. The king insists that he was waiting for him, and the duke must know why he came to him. The man asks how he can know because he does not have mind reading. His Majesty comes to the topic and says that the Kalai Expeditionary Force demanded a triumphal ceremony. His interlocutor says that they deserve it and it is worth doing as they ask. Kroll hits the table with his hand, causing tea to spill on the floor, and claims that the problem is not this, but who is in this squad? One of the leaders of the greatest merits is their worst enemy from the north, the Marquis of Winterfell. At this ceremony he will receive a lot of attention then the northerners may think too much of themselves. His Highness asks how you can talk about something like this so calmly. The Duke claims that he doesn't have to worry about it because he will shift the focus of the ceremony to something else. He has a plan to tie the hands of the northerners. The King immediately asks Togo to quickly tell about this. The main character is surprised how the man took seriously everything her father said without hesitation. No wonder the northerners are unhappy. The Duke claims that he will tie the Marquis in marriage. The King must use his authority and order him to marry. His bride must be the daughter of a noble from the South. Then they can stop him from teaming up with someone from the North. Hearing this, Nadia remembers that after she and Li Ji Ho became spouses, as a reward for success in the expedition, the Marquis of Winterfell also got married. Of course, his bride was a girl from the family whom his father introduced to the King. According to rumors, she cried constantly because of the duke's cruelty and eventually ran away. The main character felt sorry for the girl who became just a puppet in her father's plans. The brown-haired girl comes to the realization that if she now becomes this girl, then she will be able to avoid marriage with the lord and revenge. But she can't be rash, it's too early to talk about that. He claims that this is a good idea and asks who will voluntarily give him their daughter. The duke suggests that the king does not believe in the loyalty of his servants. For the sake of the country, people will certainly give up their daughter. Nadia realizes that this is her chance. She turns to his highness and asks for forgiveness. The girl says that she would like to tell him something. The king allows the main character to speak. Her father asks how dare she interfere in the conversation. But the girl ignores this and says that if they need someone who will have to go to the enemy camp to the north, then she can do it. The Duke is a little puzzled by this answer. He clenches his fist. Nadia says that she is from the Balazit family, which has served His Majesty all her life, so she deserves the most trust. She asks to be allowed to marry the enemy for the sake of the king and the well-being of their country. In her thoughts, the girl apologizes to her father for no longer being a pawn in his hands. His Highness repeats the girl's words that she is going to marry the Marquis of Winterfell. The Duke claims that his daughter does not seem to understand what she is talking about and must not know what his relationship with Winterfell is. His Highness says that this is a commendable decision, but as the girl's father said, their families are sworn enemies. It will be much easier to force someone else than to marry Nadia to him. The bad Marquis of Winterfell may not take her as his wife. But still the girl said that she had a great idea. Nadia replies that it is, at this ceremony, she will present the laurel wreath to the Marquis of Winterfell. Duke, answer that his daughter is stupid and ask if she thinks that he will just accept this wreath from her. The main character claims that no one has yet refused a laurel wreath. The father puts his hand on his head and answer that they have already planned that the girl will present the wreath to Li Ji Ho. The brown-haired woman doesn't know what to answer at first, but then says that he won't refuse her. 
When asked by her father why, she replies that she listened to their conversation while she was preparing tea and asks if the Marquis himself did not demand this ceremony. She argues that there is a point in awarding a wreath, but if someone refuses the wreath, the situation changes and all attention will be on the poor thing who was denied her recognition. Of course, the hero is the one whom people love, but the love between two is much more interesting and exciting. The main character says that people will quickly forget about his merits and asks if he will really decide with his own hands to destroy everything he strived for so much, so he will accept the wreath and then... The father does not allow the brown-haired woman to finish his sentence and says that his majesty can influence him so that he cannot refuse, then he will have no choice. The daughter claims that this is true and tells his majesty to insist on the marriage under the pretext of the plea of the official's daughter. Then he will become a magnanimous ruler who only wants to make the love of a noble lady a reality. The king says that this is an insidious plan, but he is very convincing. Still, he is a little worried because he must send the duke's daughter to the enemy camp, so he decides to first ask the duke what he thinks about this. The father claims that he did not know that his daughter had such a wonderful plan, and decides that at this ceremony his daughter will present a wreath to the Marquis of Winterfell. But judging by the way he clasps his hands on his knees, it can be understood that he is not wants this. After his highness left, Karen claims that she knew that her sister was stupid, but did not think that she was so stupid, because she did all this knowing who this Marquis was, which means she was going to voluntarily go north, even knowing that this was their enemy. The younger sister asks her father to say something, but he tells her to stop and says that it is none of her business. He tells Nadia to explain what she was thinking by suggesting this, because he made it clear exactly what her role is. The man asks if his daughter dared to disobey the order. Although the main character has received His Majesty's permission, if she cannot convince her father, she will lose again, so she must make the right move. The girl claims that she has no desire to marry a stranger whose origins are unknown, although only half, but she has Balazit blood flowing in her. The duke asks if it is only because of this, because because of her unnecessary pride, they must now give all honor to the Marquis of Winterfell. The brown-haired woman is scared, but understands that she no longer wants to live like a pawn, she claims that her father needs to let him experience this just for a moment. The daughter asks whether it is more important to prevent a possible rebellion. Because of this, they tried to divert people's interest from the ceremony. The father asks how she knew. The girl realizes that she has hit the bull's eye. The reason why father reacts so strongly to the glory of the northerners is that the imperial family is now, without exaggeration, a puppet of the Balasith duchy. In other words, this is exactly what my father has been trying to achieve for so long. The king himself is in his hands, but at the same time, he has the most vulnerable position. There have been many cases when, in such turbulent times as now, the heads of the province started a rebellion. That's why the father is worried. The Marquis is threatening his position. The main character realizes that she must dig deeper into what he is afraid of. She claims that even if not at this ceremony, they will still gather in secret. Whoever gets all the glory should be watching them, and this ceremony is the best place for that. They will give the animal, which is thirsty, a drink and put a collar on it. The duke became interested in such a story. Nadia continues to say that if she marries the Marchioness of Winterfell, they will be able to learn more quickly about changes in the North. Thanks to the sacrifice of the brown-haired woman, they will be able to strengthen their position. The girl asks her father to let her do this for the sake of their family. The man thinks that this actually makes sense. This expedition did not go as he expected. Because of the success of the Northerners, they are forced to organize a ceremony. But if Nadia went north as Winterfell's consort, they would be able to learn about their movements faster. This is a good chance to place a spy in his circle. The Duke agrees with his daughter and says that they will do as she wants. Karen did not expect such an answer. She asks her father if he really will send her sister to the north and asks what about Lord Li Ji Ho, because he wanted to give Nadia for him. A man tells his daughter to shut up so he can find him a new bride. The duke turns to his older sister and asks what she really wants. He knows well that the girl is not doing this for his sake and asks what she wants to get for her sacrifice. The main character understands that so far she has been able to deceive him. Now she just needs to answer this question correctly. She claims that she wants freedom. One day, her father will defeat his enemy, Winterfell. 
The brown-haired woman asks her father to allow her to live like a rich widow. Unmarried girls are condemned by society, but widows and divorcees are not. Nadia claims that even if she doesn't remarry, she no longer wants to bear their family's name. She does not want to be associated with someone. The girl wants an ordinary life and asks if her father can promise her this. After such a tense conversation, the main character goes out into the corridor. The deal was successful. The very first day she returned to the past, she managed to avoid marriage to Lee Ji Ho. Nadia looks out the window and sees a maid who shouts that they are to blame and asks to believe her. The head maid orders her to shut up and asks how she dared to touch the mistress's things. The maid, captured by the knights, looks at her mistress and screams that she did not steal anything. She begs the main character to do something. But the brown-haired girl doesn't seem very worried about this because she was the one who framed the maid. In the morning, the main character took the jewelry from the box and attached it to the maid's dress. She realizes that Karen's puppet has been kicked out. She was given a chance to cope with everything on her own. Although Nadia is still far from revenge, she needs to spell out her future plans in detail. While she was making plans to destroy the Balasith duchy, it was time for the ceremony. The servant informs the Marquis that preparations for the ceremony have been completed and asks him to lead the detachment because they are leaving. Flower petals were flying everywhere as part of the congratulations to the squad on their victory. Watching the soldiers march in formation, people joyfully greeted them. The main character understands that everything is exactly the same as in her previous life. Starting from the clothes and jewelry that she is currently wearing, to the places where everyone sits. If the girl had not interfered, everything would have gone on as in the previous life. The younger sister looks at her jewelry in Nadia's hands and asks what her sister will do if a crack appears on her pendant. She claims that she borrowed it because it was her father's order that once the ceremony is over, the girl should put it back. The main character thinks about how Corain claimed that she lent her her mother's jewelry, but she does not have the strength to answer her. Previously, the brown-haired girl always tried to please her, but now she doesn't care about her younger sister because she will definitely run away from there. The duke raises his hand and tells him to stop because the detachment will arrive soon. He tells his daughter to get ready, try not to screw up and honorably present the wreath to Glen of Winterfell. There was only one thing in which the ceremony from a past life differed from today's. The main character to whom she presented the wreath was the Marquis of Glen of Winterfell. The main character looks at the man behind him. It is Lee Ji Ho, the one who should be the hero of this ceremony, her ex-husband. Although they did not marry for love, there seemed to be some kind of connection between them. The girl remembers how he said that to make it as if this marriage never happened. There is only one way. But at the upcoming banquet, give Nadia alcohol with medicine, and after that put a hired man next to her, and after she wakes up, call people. The brown-haired girl's heart is beating so fast now. The king announced that for the exploits of the knights, he would grant them glory. They respond that it is an honor for them. His Highness claims to have heard that Winterfell's merits were particularly high in this expedition. Having learned about this, his soul became very warm. The Marquis asks for forgiveness and says that the rumors are exaggerated. The king tells him to cast aside modesty. Looking at him, he remembers the past ruler of Winterfell, he was also an outstanding knight. The man claims that Glayne's loyalty to Winterfell is worthy of praise, and if his father, chained to his bed, knew about his exploits, he would definitely be glad. The Marquis does not answer. The main character understands that the most painful topic for the Marquis of Winterfell is connected with his father, but his highness still talked about it. The king says that he should reward the guy's family for their loyalty, but he says that it is enough for them that his lordship knows about it. The ruler says that young people at this time are very serious. By order of the king, the official ceremony began. His Highness announced that today they had all gathered here to congratulate the heroes on their victory in the Kalia expedition. Immediately after this, the greeting of families began, and the Duke of Balasith was the first to meet the Marquis of Glen. He congratulated the young master of Winterfell and extended his hand. The guy replied that he inherited the title and is now a marquis. Glenn argues that if the duke's memory fails him, then it is better for him to leave his post and rest. The man moves his hand back a little and says that he was mistaken, 
but even though Glenn became a Marquis at such a young age, he still lacks a lot. Glenn asks what could be difficult for a man in the prime of his life. The Duke says that the guy is not really like the last Marquis with his ardor. Then he gasps and says that we are talking about a man who had an accident and he is really sorry. It's time to hand over the gifts prepared for the heroes. Nadia comes out with a bouquet and is happy that it's finally her turn. The girl holds a wreath in her thin hands and heads towards the knights. The Marquis understands why his enemy happily agreed to hold the ceremony. He decided to change the essence of the ceremony. Then the owner of that wreath should be Li Ji Ho. After all, anyone knows that her father supports him. Glenn thinks that this ceremony was originally just for himself, so he should just quietly skip it. Come to think of it, this expedition took longer than the guy thought. The Marquis suggests that a mountain of things must have accumulated at home. It would be nice if they paid them enough as a reward. Glenn opens his eyes and sees Nadia with a laurel wreath in front of him. He doesn't understand why Balazit's daughter is standing in front of him. He thinks that the girl is worried because of the large number of people. The Marquis leans over to the main character and whispers that she made a mistake due to excitement. He points his finger at the guy with black hair standing behind him, claiming that it is Li Ji Ho. Glenn invites the girl to slowly walk in that direction, and everyone will turn a blind eye to her little mistake due to excitement. But Nadia does not budge. She claims that she was not mistaken. The Marquis asks the girl what she is talking about. The brown-haired woman says that the Marquis of Winterfell has not left her mind for a long time. She hands the guy a laurel wreath and asks him to accept it. The crowd begins to gossip, but the girl continues to say that she fell in love with Glenn at first sight as soon as she saw and felt that he was the one who could take care of her for the rest of her life. The head of Winterfell never expected this. He leans over to the lady and asks if she knows what it means when an adult girl gives a wreath to a man. The main character understands that the guy is much ruder than they say about him. Nadia assures that she knows, and now she confesses her love. His Majesty turns to the Marquis of Winterfell. He claims that the beautiful lady is waiting and asks why the guy is silent. Glenn says he doesn't deserve this wreath and can't accept it. He has no idea what's going on, but the guy doesn't like it. He can't fall for it. The main character was ready for such a reaction, because he would not accept him so easily. She apologizes to the Marquis in advance and thinks that it will also be beneficial for him to marry her. The girl understands that nothing can be done and she will have to push a little. The brown-haired woman grabs the man's sleeve and says that if he is worried about her being the daughter of a concubine, he can just accept the wreath and not worry about her. Nadia is planned to first evoke pity among the people, and she succeeds. The Marquis turns to the main character and asks what she is talking about. But the pillars immediately hear indignation why the Marquis does not accept the wreath. The common people claim that he is making the young lady disgraceful. They ask if he takes it out on this young lady because of his differences with the Duke. The people urge the guy to accept the sincere love of Lady Balasith. The Marquis understands that his enemies wanted to destroy the ceremony with his own hands. The guy grabs the bouquet and claims that this is a long conversation and they will continue later. He turns around and leaves with a laurel wreath. The main character understands that she succeeded. She sighs with relief because she was able to change the future. The Duke and his daughters go into the carriage. He claims that Nadia is great. It was worth it to see Glenn's confused face. He has no choice but to accept the offer. The eldest daughter smiles and replies that he should not thank her. Suddenly someone screams, It's Lord Lee Ji Ho! He shouts that he urgently needs to talk to the Duke. The man asks what's the matter and claims that the guy must be tired. Having come all this way, he wonders why the Lord doesn't go to rest. Li Ji Ho says that he must urgently ask the Duke something. The guy heard that at today's ceremony, Lady Nadia was supposed to present a wreath to him and asks what happened. The main character looks at her father and wonders if he really told him in advance. The Duke understands what the guy is talking about and claims that this happened because the matter was urgent, so he could not inform Li Ji Ho. The man apologizes and says that he will find a more suitable match for the Lord, so he should not be upset. Well. The guy screams that he didn't come to the man to look for a new bride. He wants to know why the Duke changed his plans. The blonde replies that there was a reason for that, and this is not the place to talk about it. The Lord cries out, Doesn't it seem to the Duke that this is too much? Before he joined the army, a similar incident occurred. The father screams, pointing at the guy, What does he want now? 
because the ceremony has already taken place. The Lord is a little scared. The Duke, having calmed down, puts his hand on his shoulder and says that in any case it was his mistake because he did not warn Li Ji Ho. He asks Togo to believe that he will make amends and make up for it. The blonde asks if the guy understands what he is talking about. The Lord says he understands and agrees with the man. After this, the Duke climbs into the carriage and calls his daughters. The main character notices the look of her husband in a past life. The girl does not understand why he has such an expression on his face, although now it makes no difference to her. Now she doesn't care, because he was the first to betray her. The Marquis returned to his mansion. Now he is sitting at his desk and thinking about something. He sighs. The servant turns to his master and says that he heard that in the market everyone was only talking about the ceremony that had taken place. The lady, who was rarely seen, confessed her love to the Marquis. The guy assures that his master needs to somehow react to this, otherwise he will be forcibly married. Glenn closes his eyes, covering his face with his hand, and says that it is already late. He tells his servant to read the letter lying on the table. The guy notices that this is a letter from the royal family. After reading it, the servant understands that although this is veiled, they are telling the Marquis to get married. Glenn says that this is true, and if he continues to refuse, they will consider it as disobedience to the king's orders. The guy screams that this is already too much and asks why they are doing this to his master. After all, take at least this expedition. The Marquis obediently agreed. What else do they need? The servant claims that, in addition, their land army stably pays taxes. But even so, the government still doubts Glenn. The Marquis assumes that Duke Balazit did this because he wants to convict him of rebellion. The northern territory in which Winterfell is located was not always part of the kingdom. It was subjugated 100 years ago. The North and the South, which differed both in culture and in many other ways, could not easily make friends with each other. The Northern Army defended the border in the North from monsters, which ensured security and fertility for the South, but the Southerners, despite this, considered the Northerners wild and terrible. So the previous Marquess and Marchioness of Winterfell got into an accident because of someone's conspiracy, and the Duke of Balasith falls under suspicion the most. From there, the Duke presents the Marquess of Winterfell with a laurel wreath. Glenn says there are two reasons why they want this marriage to happen. Firstly, so that you prevent the Northerners from creating an alliance through marriage. And secondly, sending spies into the enemy camp, the servant says that this is a great way to find out about a possible rebellion before anyone else, and also Lord Li Ji Ho. According to people from the ceremony, Lady Nadia was supposed to present the wreath to him. They say he was terribly surprised by what happened. Glenn asks if it was meant for him. The servant replies that, yes, he heard that Lady Nadia and Lord Li Ji Ho secretly promised to unite hearts and lives. It seems that the plan regarding Lord Ji Ho was changed in a hurry. I remember they didn't say anything about it. The Marquis looks at the laurel wreath and realizes that he was right about the fact that this wreath was intended for the brunette. He claims that he will have to do as His Majesty wants. Otherwise, they will have an excellent reason to attack. The servant says that the girl is the daughter of the Duke. Glenn tells the guy not to worry, because no matter how you look, Nadia is just a beautiful daughter of the Duke. She will not be able to do anything on foreign land without a single ally. He doubts that the girl will withstand the cold attitude of the servants for at least a week, because it cannot be otherwise. She herself will want to return home, and the Marquis will have nothing to do with it. As a result, the Winterfell and Balasith families united, the wedding took place on the territory of Winterfell, and the engagement took place in the capital. After they quickly dealt with these minor matters, a banquet was held at the Balazit mansion to celebrate the arrival of the new family. The nobles who mocked the main character continued to gossip and said that she had no shame or conscience. The girl's father was enjoying what was happening, but now Nadia had no time to pay attention to them. The brown-haired woman invited the Marquis to dance. She must correspond to the image of a noble woman in love, who, burning with love, looks at only one person. The girl felt something at the ceremony. The Marquess of Winterfell became even more wary of the Balasith family. The main character understands that first she needs to show him that she is not dangerous. Glenn bends the girl over to dance and asks what she is thinking about. But Nadia was not taken aback and said that she thought how handsome Glenn was. The Marquis says that the girl calls him by name, although they are not close at all, 
He tells the girl to call him Marquis of Winterfell. The main character agrees, but at the end, Glenn specifically adds. The guy lets go of the girl's hands and says that he even wonders if she will also be able to smile brightly in the North. He leaves the main character alone, and everyone around begins to gossip. Someone says that the girl is poor and asks why she fell in love with a northerner. Others say that she cannot raise her head out of shame. Nadia is happy. Finally, the guy has left. Vienna can no longer squeeze out a smile. The brown-haired woman goes out onto the balcony and thinks how difficult it is. Her whole body is cramping from the fact that she forces herself to smile all day. Someone calls the main character. It was Lee Ji Ho who finally found the girl. Nadia asks what's the matter and thinks why did he come. The guy claims he came because he wanted to ask something. The brown-haired woman asks what he wants to ask, but she has nothing more to say to the Lord. The guy asks if she really hates marriage to him. The main character did not expect such a question. The guy continues and asks whether it is better for the girl to endure humiliation and sidelong glances, to go to the very center of the enemy camp, than to be with him. Nadia claims that she understands what the brunette is talking about, because from the very beginning, it was not clearly decided that they would get married. Lee Ji Ho says that the Duke has already told him everything. Plans changed at the request of the girl. Brown-haired woman, you answer that then she has nothing more to say, but the Lord does not back down. He asks if he is really not worthy to hear the truth, and therefore only that he is a stranger and his origin is unknown. Nadia doesn't understand what's wrong with him, because he was the one who betrayed her first. She, clenching her fists, says that the Lord himself was not happy about their marriage. The guy asks when he said that, but the brown-haired Ko says that she's not a fool. Ji Ho was worried about being discriminated against because of his origin, and asks if that's why he would like to marry a girl from a noble family. Nadia claims that she is just an abandoned person, and if the guys had offered to marry Karain, he would not have doubted it for a second. Ji Ho is surprised by this question and doesn't answer. As the brown-haired girl thought, he cannot answer anything, which means Karain's words were true. What was the girl waiting for? The lady says that they are not suitable for each other, so she suggests that they each go their own ways. She leaves the Lord alone. The girl came to the garden. She thinks that at least she can be alone here, but at the same moment she hears someone's steps. It turns out to be Karain. She asks if they can talk. The main character asks why her sister came here and is saddened in her thoughts that she cannot be left alone for a minute. The golden-haired girl pokes her sister in the forehead and asks why she follows the man around and disgraces their family. She doesn't think that Karin will just tolerate it. The lady claims that as the true daughter of the family, it is her responsibility to warn Nadia. She asks if she was jealous that her father only cares about his younger sister and if she wanted to get his attention, so she did this. Karin calls her sister a poor thing and claims that no matter how hard she tries, she will still remain a pawn. The brown-haired girl grins and agrees with her sister. She asks if Karine thought that they are not so different. She failed to marry Lord Ji Ho, so now it's the golden-haired lady's turn. The younger sister lashes out at Nadia in a rage and claims that she is the Duchess's daughter. The brown-haired woman asks if her sister still believes her father, because for him, a daughter is just a way to achieve a goal. Karen is furious and asks how she dares to classify her among such scum and whether she is laughing at her now. The girl threatens to tell her father about everything, but Nadia's gaze is directed at Karine's neck, where her mother's necklace hangs. The younger sister notices that the girl is looking at her mother's jewelry. She takes it off and asks if it is the jewelry that Nadia's mother received from her father. The golden-haired lady claims that he gave it because he thought that she would give birth to a son. A girl appeared, and the brown-haired woman did not deserve it. She asks if the girl wants to take it. If yes, then let him kneel and belittle. Karain orders her to repeat the words that the girl is sorry for acting so recklessly towards her and will never irritate her younger sister again. The golden-haired lady claims that if she begs convincingly, she will forgive or just get rid of him because she has a lot of such trinkets. You can throw one away. She began to hold her hand with the necklace over the pond. The main character is furious. Her sister asks if she wants to, if nothing can be done, the girl is already preparing to throw the necklace into the pond. But the brown-haired woman stops her and asks if her sister will really give him away if she gets on her knees. My sister assures me that this will happen. She thinks that Nadia has nothing left, 
Such a quiet girl suddenly starts showing herself and irritating her, now she will learn her lesson. In any case, the golden-haired lady is not going to return the jewelry. She orders the main character to kneel faster, because she is generous if you ask nicely. The brown-haired woman, without wasting any time, throws her sister into the pond, even in shock and furiously screaming whether Nadia has gone crazy and what the hell is she doing, because she doesn't think that Karain is letting her get away with this. The main character asks what will happen if she doesn't let her down. She holds the jewelry in her hands and claims that the golden-haired lady would still not return it, no matter how much she begged. A similar thing happened in a past life. Then the brown-haired woman unquestioningly obeyed her sister, but as a result, she was never able to return the necklace. The main character says that as a child, she thought a lot about this. Where did her sisters come from so much hatred towards her? She was wondering if Karen would recognize her as her sister if she did as she said. But she realized that the younger sister hated her for no reason. Therefore, now she gave Karen a real reason, a real reason to hate her. The golden-haired lady does not recognize her sister. In her thoughts, she asks if this is exactly the Nadia she knew. The girl gets goosebumps. Her sister is like a different person. People came running to the screams. They started shouting that the person was in the water, and they needed to quickly bring something to cover her. One of the guys puts his jacket on the lady and asks if she's okay. The duke runs out into the street and asks what kind of noise his daughter made in the middle of the night. Karin immediately rushes into her father's arms with tears in her eyes. She screams that it's all that dirty girl and points at Nadia. She thinks that her sister has come to an end. The duke asks if this is true. Karain is sure that the girls will not leave because she has evidence. But the main character only finds it funny to hear such words. She covers her mouth with her hands so that no one notices. The brown-haired girl turns to her sister and says that despite all her hatred, how can you lie like that? She didn't listen to her and still went to the edge, and she said that it was dangerous there. Nadia claims that she was only trying to get her out of there and asks if her sister is afraid that they will think badly of her but her lies disgrace their family more. The golden-haired lady claims that it was Nadia. Her sister threatened her with her mother's necklace, and the girl pushed her. Some of the people start whispering about threats, they say, since she threatened with the necklace. It means she has a bad character. They ponder why the heirloom of the mother of the first daughter is in the second, and wonder if she is loved more in the duchy. Karain says that this is not so and is trying to straighten out. But the duke puts his hand on her shoulder and says that she is cold. She better go back to the restroom before she catches a cold. He thinks that if he leaves this matter, rumors will circulate among the rumors. The golden-haired lady is indignant that this is unfair. She asks to listen to her. The father just shouts to the servant to take Karen into the room. He tells the guests that there was a small quarrel between the sisters, and he is sorry that it happened on such a bright day. But people leave and continue to gossip along the way. They claim that the noble daughter of Balasith brought such disgrace to the family. One of the ladies says that she knew that someday this would happen and she would remain quiet for a while. Friction notices that the father did not side with Karain, contrary to what she expected. But now it doesn't matter to her, because she returned her mother's necklace and can now safely leave this place. The Marquis with the knights is in the forest near the lands of Winterfell. One of the knights calls his master. Glenn claims that he is too noisy and should return to his place. Fabian tells the Marcus not to be like that. He will only ask something and come back. However, this is a figurative question. The servant asks whether the mistress's confession was not sincere, and the guy at the same moment kicks his servant. The Marquis claims that if the guy is going to continue talking such nonsense, then let him get lost. Fabian says that you also know that she is deceiving his master. But looking at her face during the ceremony, it seemed to him that she was sincere, and the guy is not particularly sure that she was lying. Glenn tells his servant not to trust appearances. Nadia is the daughter of a duke. She could stab her in the back at any moment. He invites Fabian to just look at her devotion. He wonders if it is true in order to help their family in difficult times, or the girl only plans to keep an eye on them. The knight understands that his master is right, the Marquis says that if the guy understands, then let him return to his place, because he is the girl's guard and must be careful. If she has a problem, it will become a headache. Fabian returns to the carriage. He thinks that he is happy to go with her after what he heard. This worries him even more.
The main character looks out from the carriage and tells her escort that she wanted to talk to him, but the knight disappeared so she had to wait. Fabian. He almost faints from this. He says that he had a small matter, and he hopes that the girl did not hear their conversation. Nadia says that she heard that the guys appointed her as a guard and asks what his name is. The servant says his name is Fabian Knox. The brown-haired woman compliments him, saying that it is a beautiful name. The guy looks away and thanks his mistress. The girl looks at Fabian and claims that, as she thought, the guy is awkward with her. The knight realizes that he was too obvious. The main character claims that she understands, because everyone knows that the Balasith and Winterfell families are enemies. Nadia will assure that her feelings for the Marquis are real. Fabian no longer knows who to believe. He remembers Glenn's words about not judging by appearance. The knight waves his hands and says that he is just very shy. The guy asks if his mistress's mother is in the north for the first time and offers to tell him about the north while they are driving. The brown-haired woman thanks Fabian. She was just bored. The main character thinks what a relief it is. It seems that she managed to break through the barrier of the younger knight. After the story, Nadia falls asleep. The girl wakes up from a knock on the window. Opening the window, she sees her knight. He invites the lady to go out for a while, because they have arrived at the Winterfell mansion. The brown-haired woman, of course, knew that preparations for the wedding ceremony were in a hurry, but she did not expect this at all. Rumors claim that Glenn's mother brought this wedding dress with her. It wasn't long before the wedding, so the decision was made to choose it. The maid claims that the girl may have already heard, but now there is an influx of monsters in the north and a lean season, so people are not in the best position, which is why a modest wedding ceremony is planned. The maid claims that, of course, a wedding comes once in a lifetime. But the main character doesn't let her finish her sentence and says that everything is fine, she understands. The maid is shocked by this answer. She asks what her mistress said. Nadia claims that if she's next to Glenn, it doesn't matter how big the wedding is. She smiles warmly and says that besides, she is now a marquise, so she must think about her people. A woman turns to the brown-haired woman. She says that, since the girl thinks so, then she can be calm. The lady hopes that Nadia will always think this way. The main character greets Mrs. Grace. Grace Ground is Glenn of Winterfell's aunt. The previous Marquise has already died, and the previous Marquis is bedridden, so she is now the eldest madam in this family. The woman claims that this dress suits Nadia very well. She says that when Glenn sees her, who will go crazy? The main character thanks the lady and says that she would be glad. A lady with silver hair approaches the girl and takes a strand of her hair in her hand. She tells Nadia that because of her father, Glenn is even rude to her, but assures that there is nothing to worry about because the brown-haired woman is so beautiful that over time Glenn will open his heart to her. The lady says that she will help, and the main character needs to focus only on opening his soul. The lady knows what the mistress wanted to tell her with these words. Grace knows that the Marquis has not yet recognized Nadia. The main character smiles warmly and says that she will remember this, after which Aunt Glena says that it's time for her, and in parting asks if the girl knows what is most important in seduction. She suggests preparing well. Only one thing comes to mind for the brown-haired woman, her wedding night. She thought that they would want to touch her, so she would refuse to spend the night together. But what if this man offered to stay together for the night? Now the main character in a wedding dress is heading to her groom, but the girl can't stop thinking about the conversation with Mrs. Grace. She constantly thought about it. The thought that they could sleep together could not get out of her head. The bride and groom had to say their vows, but all that was on the girls' minds was whether they would sleep in the same room immediately after the wedding ceremony. Glenn is asked if he takes Nadia Balazit as his wife and vows to love her forever. The Marquis answers yes. When Nadia asks if she is taking Glenn Winterfell as her husband, the girl continues to think whether the Marquis will want to stay in the same bed with her because he really hates her. But what if he really wants this? What should she do then? The brown-haired woman did not expect this. When the main character is called a second time, she realizes what is happening and answers yes. Then they are told to seal the oath with a kiss. The girl was only thinking about how they would share the room. The kiss completely flew out of her head. The brown-haired woman understands that the Marquis must pretend that they are kissing. What kind of cohabitation can we talk about? But Glenn kisses the girl for real, and they are declared husband and wife. Nadia is shocked because the Marquis actually kissed her. 
That same day in the evening, the brown-haired woman wanders around the room and doesn't know what to do or what to do. The girl is running out of time, and her fiancé will come soon. She wonders if they will really sleep together. He really kissed her. But the girl's thoughts are interrupted by Glenn, who enters the room. Nadia realizes that he really came. The girl says that she was waiting for him, but her thoughts are not calm. She is thinking about what to do and how to be, because she can't run away anymore. The Marquis tells her not to be mistaken. He claims that they will never contact the daughter of the Duke of Balazit, and came only to say this personally. The main character asks her husband to wait, but he ignores her request and simply leaves. The maids notice that sobs are coming from their mistress's room. The girl says that her feelings are sincere. Why is Glenn so cruel? Sitting on the floor in the room, she sighs with relief and thinks how good it is that he left. The main character in her thoughts hopes that he never changes his mind. The girl sees a plate of wine and snacks on the table. She remembers that she didn't even eat properly today. The brown-haired woman starts her meal. She notices that the beef jerky is very tasty, and the wine too. Then she decides to try the fruit. Having eaten to the fullest, Nadia goes to bed and thinks how good it is. There is nothing more to worry about, and the bed is so soft. It seems that she will fall asleep. The next day, the maids gossip among themselves. One of them asks if they heard about what happened yesterday. The gentleman immediately left their mistress's room, without staying there even for five minutes. He was very angry. Another claims that she bet that he would not come to her at all. Another maid asks what happened after. The girl with disposable hair suggests that most likely they had a fight, and Nadia should be ashamed now. Another maid comes up to them from behind and says that she heard the lady crying for a long time. According to another maid, the lady's maid, she looked like an unrequited girl in love who was rejected. When the maid came to the main character, she apologized and said that she could not sleep without alcohol. The servants thought that she would behave arrogantly, but still the master could not do otherwise. The girls are about to leave the room and continue their work. The Marquis and two knights watch this all from the corner. One of them tells his master that the maids need to be forced to keep their mouths shut. The second agrees and says that this must be done in any way. Glenn says that there is no need to do this. You just need to close your eyes to it. He asks if the guys think that the maids will love her and what Nadia is doing now. The knight replies that she has officially become a marquise, and shouldn't she be in charge of the household? The marquis asks if he is saying that the girl has fully started spying on them. He turns to Fabian and claims that he is her guard, and the guy asks if his master wants him to watch her. Glenn replies that it is so. The guy should watch whether the brown-haired woman is doing anything suspicious, whether she is sending letters about her parents' house. The knight should always be next to her and report everything to the marquis. The main character asks if Glenn sent a knight to guard her. Fabian answers that there are attacks, and from this day on he will take care of his mistress. Nadia thinks whether the Marquis is angry because she is watching him. The girl folds her hands and with a beaming smile on her face says that she is very glad that her husband cares about her so much. The brown-haired woman says that the Marquis thought that the girl would be uncomfortable with strangers and sent Fabian. How good he is! The knight, with a forced smile, replies that everything is exactly like that, but he came to watch over Nadia, and not to protect her, and the girl is so happy that he is even ashamed. The knight says that he will wait at the door, and his mistress can calmly go about her business. The main character understands that her fiancé has decided to watch her all day long. She needs to somehow convince him that she is not a spy. The girl asks the butler to bring the household book. Gordon obeys his mistress, and within a minute she is already sitting with her in her arms, she is clearly surprised. Nadia asks why they have so much debt. In a past life, she knew that the situation in Winterfell was not very good. This amount was already too much. The servant claims that this is a feature of the North. Every few years they are attacked by a wave of monsters. Their land is very depleted. So there are really no resources and no attractions either. Nadia asks if they don't receive rewards from the king for killing monsters every year and what these funds are spent on. The butler replies that thanks to that money they were able to survive until today. Moreover, quite recently, the Marquis took part in the Kalia expedition. The brown-haired woman claims that therefore they can no longer participate in expeditions. She did not even know that war requires so much expense. The servant claims that they did not want to take part in this, but someone demanded that they fulfill their duty. Gordon realizes what he just said. 
The main character asks if by this he means her father. Girl A throws her head back in the chair, and I think that in any case, she prepared a plan on how to make money, but she didn't think that the amount of debt was so large. She's wondering how the Marquis of Winterfell paid off his debts in a past life. The butler claims that he has a good solution, because now she has also become part of the Winterfell family. He asks to be allowed to speak directly, and argues that such difficult times for her new family, if the girl uses the dowry to pay off her debts, won't she help with this? The brown-haired woman thought why he gave her the seal from the warehouse so easily, it means he wants to test her, asking her to resolve financial problems. Gordon asks whether the Marquis will be happy if she helps. However, Nadia says that it is impossible. The butler asks his mistress to think again. The main character asks him to understand that she is not saying this because she does not want to help the Winterfell family. Looking at the expense book, it is clear that every year the debt is slowly growing. Previously, the servant said that the reason is the peculiarity of the North, so giving a dowry to the Duke's daughter will not solve this issue in the long term. In the end, the debt will reappear and grow. The butler doesn't know what to answer to this. After a couple of seconds, he tries to straighten out and asks if the situation for their lands is not now hopeless. The brown-haired woman slams her hand on the table and claims that they will correct the peculiarity of their territory. The servant does not understand what his mistress is talking about, and she begins to tell how to achieve this. When the knight returns to the Marquis, Glenn asks if his wife said that she could not use a single coin from the dowry. Fabian claims that this is not so. He repeats the words of the main character that rather than paying off the debt right now, it is better to start increasing the dowry. Other knights say that the guy is naive and believes Nadia, because she only seems good. One of the knights screams that no matter what, she said that she would not give her dowry. Fabian says the girl looked serious when she spoke about the financial situation of the lands. He asks his master whether he can trust such a slow-witted person to spy on my wife. Another, pressing his colleague with his hand, says how poor their youngest is. Glenn tells them all to go back to their seats because they are making too much noise. The main character is walking along the corridor at this time. She sees that there are a lot of cases that need to be resolved. Cobwebs and sprinkled statues are hanging in the corners of the estate. Someone's screams are tearing the brown-haired woman out of her thoughts. One man shouts, doesn't the butler know how long they've been waiting? Gordon tries to calm them down. Having gone a little lower, the lady asks her servant what is happening here. One of the guests asks if this is the daughter of the Duke of Balazit. Nadia asks them to call her Marchioness of Winterfell. A man asks for forgiveness for introducing himself late and says that he is Shylock. Another claims that he is Wayne from the Alliance of Northern Traders. The woman behind also introduces herself. She says that her name is Katerina and our trading company is Kreta. The main character says that they should leave the formalities and say what they were talking about here. Shylock say that in this case, they can tell her something. He shouts for the lady to give them the money. The day will soon come to repay the funds borrowed by the Marquis. Nadia is shocked, but the guy continues to scream. He says that he heard that the girl brought with her an impressive dowry. If she says that this time she will not be able to pay her debts, they will take back the wind-shaded plane that was left as collateral. The main character, I understand that this is the only fertile land in this depleted territory. She remembered how the Marquis paid off his debts in a past life. He simply gave them this land. The girl asks when the day of repayment of debts will come. Gordon replies that this will happen in three months. The brown-haired woman understands that if the plane is taken away, the Winterfell family will be completely poor. No matter how powerful the Marquis army is, no matter how much finance he has, he will not be able to become the leader who unites the North. Nadia asks to give them two more months. If they postpone repayment of the debt for another two months, she will resolve this issue. Shylock says that he knows that the girl brought with her an impressive dowry and asks why she needs two extra months. Nadia confidently replies that she uses her dowry for business. The man asks what all this means, and instead of paying off her debts, the lady is going to open a business. The Marchioness states that the Winterfell family is closely related to the merchants from the northern regions. It would be good if they would consider their long-term friendship with them and help in creating a better future for Winterfell. She says that she will never forget their help. Of course, if the business fails, they will take the land left as collateral. Traders understand that then they have nothing to lose. Shylock claps and claims that he admires the wisdom of the lady. He is ready to give an answer right now. 
but he needs to discuss this with other merchants, he asks if the girl will wait. The main game does not say that it is ready to wait as long as necessary. The merchant bows and thanks. He says that he will definitely give an answer that she will like it. With an evil grin on his face, he leaves the estate. A man thinks whether the business of a girl who has lived her whole life without knowing troubles will be crowned with success. He is already making plans to take possession of the best land. Nadia sighs with relief because they are finally gone. The butler asks what kind of business his lady was talking about, because if they lose the plane, the lady assures Gordon that there is nothing to worry about, they will return the money as planned. The servant asks why the extra time, the girl replies that she just wanted to talk to him about this, she orders the butler to invite to the mansion everyone who wants to postpone the day of repayment of the debt. She will need to buy something from them. Gordon doesn't understand what his lady wants to buy, but Nadia repeats that she wants to open a business. Not everyone can do a really important business. They must show what will be received by those who trust them and are willing to wait. When the guests arrive at the estate, one of them asks if the business the girl was talking about is creating herbal tea from the thorny vine. The main character calmly says that this is exactly so, and she is confident in her success. The guests think what nonsense she is talking about. The thorny vine is a grass that only poor people accept. It has no value. It is an ordinary weed. Nadia asks if they could buy this herb for her in bulk. Wayne and Katerina don't trust this plan. The man says that the price of this herb is quite low, but if the girl wants to purchase in market quantities, she will need some capital, and will she have it? The brown-haired woman claims that she plans to use her dowry. Wayne already choked on his tea when he heard that the girl was going to buy weeds with that money. He looks at the butler and thinks that it would be better if the girl bought dresses and jewelry. At least they could be resold. He notices that the butler is not dissuading his mistress. He already seems to have given up. When the Marquise spoke so confidently last time, Wayne thought that she had a good plan, but he didn't even think that she was so unreasonable. Katerina asks her to forgive her, but she thinks that such a business is not the best option. The main character asks why the woman claims that prickly lasagna has no value, because there are many good herbs that can replace it, and besides, if you take into account the costs of transportation and storage, they will suffer big losses. Nadia says that they are mistaken about something, she invited them here not for discussion, but for hiring. The girl is ready to pay them more than usual. They will definitely not suffer any losses. The guests look at each other and answer that if the Marquis says so, then they will contact all trading companies on the continent. He thinks that there will be no problems in providing the required volume of goods. The brown-haired woman smiles and says that all hope is only with them. They must take care of everything without exception. Two months later, Grace comes to the Marquis's room and says that she heard that Nadia still hasn't taken care of anything, besides her useless grass, and asks if Glenn will continue to watch her do nonsense. The Marquis claims that she started this business with money from her dowry, and he has no right to interfere with her. The aunt assures that the main character does not have any financial literacy, since she believes that the grass will bring her money, and asks whether she can be trusted with the household, soon the whole day of debt repayment. The Marquis puts down his pen and turns to his aunt. Grace says that she didn't watch her language, but asks Glenn to remember one thing. She said this because she is thinking about the future of the family. Stalin remains alone in his office and thinks about the day of repayment of debts. Suddenly, he hears that someone is running. Gordon bursts into the office and asks if his master heard the news. Glenn gets up from his chair and asks which one. The butler, breathing heavily as he runs, says that they are saved and they will not have to give up the plane. He claims that all this is thanks to the lady. The Marquis cannot believe his ears. In a village in the south, two guys are talking about how a girl recently died. Her hand was all numb, and in the end, this girl also fell ill with the plague. One of the guys asks if it was just her, because in the last few months, there hasn't been a day when they haven't burned corpses. Not only their village is suffering, but all the lands in the kingdom, starting from the southern territories. He asks when they will find a cure. Suddenly, a man comes running to the guys and asks if they have heard the news, because they have finally found a cure for the plague. This is tea made from the herbs of the thorny vine. They say you can be cured with it. The traders, having heard this news, immediately decided to buy grass from the thorny vine. But someone has already bought everything. Now the main character is looking at the villagers who are buying thorny vines. 
Fabian says not to rush, because there are a lot of goods. The woman says that she was very worried that her daughter would die. She thinks that they sold it so cheap, because usually in such cases the price is very high, so the poor cannot afford it. The knight claims that this is all thanks to the generosity of the Marquise. She made sure that everyone could be cured. A decree was issued to start supplying herbal tea at an affordable price, otherwise from areas where the situation is more serious. Increasing the price or resale, as well as stockpiling of herbs is prohibited. Everything was done to reduce losses among the poor. Now Nadia is standing on the bridge. She is talking with Wayne. The man tells the lady about her worries that the southern territories will think that they specially monopolized all the medicine in the north so that the epidemic would flourish among them. The Marquise assures that the likelihood of this is low. First of all, it was not Winterfell that bought up all the vines, the author says, standing in front of her. In addition, the girl is the daughter of the Duke of Balazit from the south. The prickly vine grass sold out faster than expected. Thanks to this, traders who agreed to wait and helped in business received great benefits. The debt that the girl gave to Katerina was 97,200 gold, and Wayne's debt was 10,087. Shylock could not believe that she really repaid the debt. Moreover, she offered cooperation only to those who agreed to wait. Nadia approaches the merchant. She claims that it seems that the conversation with the other merchants did not go well, but she was so waiting for a letter from him. She says that if the guests have everything, then she will ask only those who helped her with the business to stay, let the rest go out. The girl claims that she will wait for the day to meet Mr. Shylock again. The merchant says that he will also wait, and until then, let everything be fine with the lady. He clenches his fists and leaves. After this, the main character comes to her husband. She asks if he believes her now. After increasing her devotion, she sorted out her debts. The guy claims that she cannot see the future, but somehow she found out about what would happen. Nadia says that when she was in the South, she accidentally saw a report from the head of the Arl lands in her father's office. Then she assumed that the plague would spread throughout the kingdom. The guy asks what about the cure. The brown-haired woman says that the maid who looked after her as a child used to lead a nomadic life every night. She told her about her life, and once said that the grass of the thorny vine can help with a fatal illness when fever covers the whole body. Of course, this is all a lie. The Marquis apologizes for misunderstanding Nadia. The girl thanks him for saying so. Glenn claims that when the girl said that she would pay off her debts after she earned money, he thought that she was lying because. The main character does not allow him to finish his sentence and says that it is because her father is the Duke of Balasith. The Marquis says that it is so. He doesn't understand why the girl is helping him if Nadia's father finds out he won't like it. The brown-haired woman asks how the Marquis listened to her all this time. She claims that she has already said several times that she loves him and asks if he remembers what she told him. Glenn realizes that she is talking about love again. The guy says that whatever the reason, she paid off Winterfell's debts. This means that if she has a request, he will fulfill it. The main character didn't even think that he would offer it himself. She would like to say everything that is in her heart, but now she cannot. The girl holds out her hands and says that she wants her husband to hug her once. The Marquis is surprised by such a request. The girl asks if this is too difficult a request. He replies that everything is not so, and just thought that she had another desire, for example, for him to punish the gossiping maids, or to ask him to return all the money spent over time. Nadia assures that if she had used such techniques, she would never have become a member of the Winterfell family. She asks if it would be better for him to fulfill the request. Glenn realizes that he can do this. He hugs his wife back and presses her to him. The guy notices that she smells sweet. Suddenly, someone from the corridor shouts that it's time for a business meeting. Nadia thinks what a relief this is. Otherwise, she was worried about how they could stop hugging. She tells her husband that she is sorry, but she has to go. Marquis says that everything is fine and she can go. When the main character leaves the room, she thanks Glenn for fulfilling her wish. And in his thoughts, he wonders whether he has now begun to trust her. The girl comes to her servants. She asks how things are going. The guys answer that thanks to double accounting, which the mistress taught them. Everything goes smoothly. Wayne. You say that this is the first time you've heard of this. Nadia has divided expenses and income into two parts, and now it's easier to track the movement of money. I ask if the lady herself came up with such a method. The main character replies that she is not that smart 
and learned this from one person who came from afar. The merchant claims that he does not know where this person is from, but he is simply incredible. Nadia says that you agree. He knew a lot. The girl remembers how in a past life she sat with Lee Ji Ho and asked us what his country was like. The brunette replied that in the world he lived in, women and men could receive the same education, and it was common. The main character asked if he was joking. The guy said with confidence that they used their knowledge to open their own business. They were looking for a business that they really wanted to do. The brown-haired woman said that she also wants to live like this. Lee Ji Ho put his hand on hers and said that she was very smart, and he was sorry that the girl had lived all her life in her father's shadow. He claimed that he wanted her to have a chance to reveal all her talents. Nadia recalls that every time they met, he told her something new. Thanks to him, she was able to learn to think more broadly. This helped her when she returned to the past and began to make plans. But despite this, he abandoned the main character to climb to a higher place. Wayne says that the lady should be careful with Shylock because he is very cunning and greedy, so he will never give up so easily. Nadia says not to worry about it. They know who her father hates most, those who do not pay taxes on time. The Duke sits in his office and orders to immediately begin a tax audit of merchants in the North and find everything they have. When he allowed his daughter to use her dowry for her stupid business, he could not even imagine that she would be so successful. The man thinks that something is wrong here, and how could this be a mere accident? He is already starting to think about betrayal. But the Duke brushes aside such thoughts, because how could she have found out about something that was unknown to him and come up with such a plan? Nadia was just lucky this time it only played into the hands of Winterfell. He squeezes the document in his hands and thinks that in any case, nothing lasts forever, time will pass, and their budget will again be at the bottom. At this time, the main character had already finished renovating the estate. The butler almost cries and claims that this is all thanks to their mistress's business. He is so grateful to her. The girl not only paid off the debt, but also solved the problem with the repairs. The brown-haired woman says that their mansion has only become brighter, and that's good. Nadia thinks she can take a breath now, and says she will go to her office. It was hard for her for a while, but she did what she had to do. She felt much better. On her way out, she tells her Gordon that she has something for him. She points to the bag of money and says it's a special reward for the best butler. He put a lot of effort into building a farm that didn't exist. The servant claims that this is too much money for him and she should save this money for the future. But the main character claims that all this time their lands existed only thanks to the hard work of their servants, and their efforts should be adequately rewarded. The brown-haired man says that revenge must have been often inconvenient in front of his subordinates due to problems with salaries. Now he will be able to maintain his authority by paying them. The butler almost cries. He remembers the annual waves of monster constant problems with food and problems in the mansion due to increasing debts. He cannot believe that everything was resolved so easily. Gordon reports that his lady is a miracle sent to him by the ancestors of the family. He will honor and take care of her all his life. The main character thanks her subordinate. She did not think that he would become so faithful to her. The knight tells the butler to stop crying. The main character, I understand, that thanks to her successful business, the layer began to trust her, and she must continue in the same spirit to complete her plan. Looking out the window, she notices a red flag and asks what it is. Fabian claims that this is the speaker. Since the flag is red, it means the message is urgent. Nadia asks why they are so calm since this is an urgent message. Does he have any idea what happened? The guy says that a red flag at this time means there is a high probability that Count Alteo has crossed the border. County Alteo is located south of Winterfell. It is not part of either the Northern Commonwealth or the Father's Alliance. It is the third force. The girl understands that relations between neighboring territories may be bad, but judging by the reaction of those two, they are clearly hiding something. The main character asks if when they said it at that time, they meant that they do this every year. Apparently, she hit the nail on the head. There is no money or resources in Winterfell, and their neighbors are also crazy since they don't answer. Nadia sits with her husband and says that she heard news that neighbors were encroaching on their territory. Glenn says that this happens sometimes, and the girl shouldn't worry because he'll be back soon. The brown-haired woman says that her husband is going to the battlefield. How can she not worry? The Marquis looks at her coldly, 
but then sighs and thinks that it would be strange if she didn't worry when her husband goes to war. This is a normal reaction. Fabian claims that his mistress has nothing to worry about. Winterfell's army is the strongest in the north and in the entire kingdom, and the lord is the strongest warrior in the entire army. Alteo's low-grade soldiers cannot be their rivals. Glenn orders his servant to remain silent. The main character sees how confident he is and thinks that in this case she has nothing to worry about. Then maybe she should think about what territories to take from her enemies. Well, the girl suddenly comes to a realization, because if they always win, then where are the lands? Winterfell, after all. Apart from the northern territories, it owns nothing else. The girl asks the knight whether wars often happen with Alteo. He claims that everything is so. Then the main character asks why they didn't take the land, because there were so many chances. Fabian doesn't know if this question can be answered, but the Marquis says that it is because of the fortress. They win on the battlefield, but as soon as the enemies feel threatened, they hide in the Belong Fortress. The knight says that his master is right and they are too vile. He doesn't want to admit it, but Belong Fortress is called a heavenly gift. After all, when their enemies are hiding there, they cannot do anything. The Wind Knights do not come out, so they give up and return. The guy sighs and says that most of Alteo's soldiers are mercenaries, but even that doesn't bother them, but they can't turn a blind eye to the fact that they are holding their citizens who should be farming. The main character remembered everything, because the Belong Fortress is known for being located next to a rich source of iron ore. If everything is like this using that method, they will be able to capture it without any problems. Moreover, not far from this place, they will find the Dragon Rio. Last time, the appearance of the dragon was a disaster, but this time everything is different because there is a whole warehouse of treasures, and the owner has already died. The lady with brown hair thinks that she cannot just watch what is happening, because he himself gave her a reason, and she will not sit idly by. At this time, one of the servants enters the room and tells the master that it is time to leave. Then the guy gets up from his seat and says, okay, and then goes to his bride. He claims that he will be back soon. The young lady thinks that he is so confident in himself and speaks as if he is going to have fun and not to war. The girl understands that Glenn is an unusual man. She turns to him. And when the guy turns around, she, with an innocent expression on her face, tells him to be careful and come back quickly. Glenn is silent for a moment and then says, okay, and leaves the room. Then he heads down the corridor and a knight turns to him. He tells his master that as he saw, their relationship is not so bad. The guy asks if it seemed like that to him and the knight says that anyone else said the same thing. Then the young man turns around, and the servant says not to trust this girl. He understands everything. After all, a beautiful and fragile girl says pleasant words to his master, and it would be strange if he did not begin to feel something for her. But he asks the Marquis not to believe her and not to give his heart, because he himself knows the reason well. The young man with silver hair says that of course he knows, but the girl paid off their debts, and he cannot behave rudely with her. He turns around and says that he doesn't really trust her, and the knight claims that in that case he has nothing to worry about. A few days later, the Marquess is in the Winterfell camp discussing the progress of the war. His interlocutor says that everything is going as they expected, and their opponents have locked themselves in the fortress. So he asks if they should recall the army. Glenn thinks about it, and the man says that if he doesn't want to, then they can try to take the fortress. He claims that the Count's army suffered on the battlefield and they will need time to replenish their numbers. The main character understands that he also wants this. However, he says that it is not necessary because the guy does not want to risk the lives of soldiers in a battle, the probability of failure of which is high. Then the man says that if this is what his master wants, then they will do it. But suddenly some screams are heard outside. The knights scream that entry is prohibited. The man says that it's somehow noisy outside and he'll go check it out. The Marquis says that there is no need because he had a desire to clear his head, so let the guy rest. But when he heads to the door, he hears the knight screaming for the man to wait and claiming that this is why they are in a difficult situation. However, when Glenn opens the entrance to the tent, he sees a familiar face. He asks Nadia if this is it. The girl just looks at him in response. Then the main character thinks why she is there. But the young lady just takes off her hood and tells Glenn that they haven't seen each other for a long time so she missed him. The guy is a little surprised by this, and the main character says that thank God everything is fine with him and what a relief it is. The young man thinks that just a couple of days ago, she did not wish him a happy journey. He understands that the war is going according to plan, and he was already thinking about returning home, 
so he has no assumptions about what is in her head. The guy wonders if she could have come there and worry about him, but then sighs and thinks that this cannot be, after which he turns around and offers to go inside first. Then the young lady sits down at the table with a card, and Glenn asks why she came. His wife replies that she wrote a military request. The young man, shocked by this, asks what she is talking about. The young lady says that she has found a way to capture Belong Fortress, but it seems they didn't believe her. As the Marquis thought, she did not come there because she was worried about him, but he thinks that this is worth rejoicing at. The guy puts his hand on his head and thinks that the very fact that he just thought about this is already infuriating. The young man asks if she knows what a military request means in wartime, and the main character says that the price for a false report is execution, and she knows it. She also adds that she told the truth, so she has nothing to worry about. Then that man turns to her and says that, looking at her confidence, it seems that this method will bring them victory. So he suggests seeing how good the plan is. The main character thanks Lord Giscard, and he says that he will start then. She points to the map and says that there they must build a mountain in the west, and in another area in the north they need to dig a cave. The mountain will be a trap, so it does not need to be built to the end, and the most important thing is the cave. They must place a lot of gunpowder and oil underground and set everything on fire. When the cave collapses, the fortress will fall along with it, then they will be able to capture the enemies at once. The guy understands that in a situation where they don't know how to take the fortress, a cave is a good option. He claims that they didn't even think about it, but there are a lot of granite rocks in the area, and they have already checked the area. The young lady says that there is no need to worry about this, and she saw in her father's office information about the weak point of the Belong Fortress. It said that there were a lot of soft rocks on the fortress server, so there would be no problems. The guy understands that the problem with the Belong Fortress has been a headache for his ancestors, and if they just retreat now, then someday it will come up again. And if Nadia is telling the truth, then they will be able to put an end to it once and for all. The young lady claims that she can vouch for the materials her father has collected in case someone becomes his enemy. And the Lord says that the Duke of Balasith must have plenty of such papers. But he asks if the young lady is not herself from the Balasith family. The man thinks that there is nothing he likes about her. But suddenly Glenn turns to Lord Giscard. He asks if the problem with the Belong Fortress bothered me as much as he did. But if the girl told the truth, then this could be their chance. So he says to send people to the north. It won't be that difficult to check whether there really are a lot of soft rocks there. Then the man agrees. And the main character says that since the young lady is ready to put her life on the line, he does not think that she is deceiving them. The young lady claims that she knew so, because only her husband trusts her. The guy is a little shocked by these words. He thinks that this is not what he meant. But the main heroine just grabs his hand and tells him to take care of himself and consider this her order. A little time later, the Lord looks at the ruined fortress. He thinks that this cannot be, and the girl did not lie. When they go inside the fortress, they see the owner of those lands there. He screams in fear that he said that he was giving up. He also asks if the Marquis of Winterfell knows about aristocratic pride, because even if he is his prisoner, he is still a nobleman. Therefore, Glenn must follow aristocratic laws. But the guy just puts a knife to his throat and asks if he is talking about pride and laws. After all, less than six months had passed since the Winterfell army returned from the Calia expedition. The soldiers sacrificed themselves for the sake of the kingdom, and the count, without even allowing them to rest, declared a new war. The young man asks if this is what he calls pride. His interlocutor says that he still cannot finish off the nobleman, because if he harms him. But suddenly, someone interrupts him and says that Count Alteo is right, because even though the Marquis won the war, he cannot take the life of his enemy. Then she approaches Alteo and asks what about the fact that the Count, having lost and found himself in captivity, committed suicide out of shame. After all, this is the only way to preserve the pride of an aristocrat. The man is shocked by this. He wonders if the girl is crazy. And then he bows down and thinks that at this rate, he really might die soon. Therefore, the guy screams for them to spare him, and if they allow him to live, he will give them all the wealth. Then the young lady hands him a non-aggression treaty and says that if he signs it, they will spare his life. When the guy reads this, he is shocked. It says that firstly, the county of Altea has been attacking the lands of Winterfell for 30 years. Secondly, they, as the losing side, will pay 100,000 gold. And thirdly, Altea County will transfer. All rights to the Rhinelands include the Belong Fortress. After this, 
the young lady tells him not to even think about discussing the points, and then asks him why he is sitting, and he claims that he had better sign quickly. After this, the Knights of Winterfell all celebrate. One of them says that her soul has become easier because they have finally sorted out this protracted war for territory, and the other claims that he is speaking correctly. He asks if his friend saw the Count's expression when the girl took out the contract. The guy says that he couldn't even think that it would be possible to find a loophole in the mountainous area, and the one who suggested it was, after all, the lady. Lord Giscard silently listens to all this, and at this time the knights offer to drink to their mistress. The main character thinks that first the thorny vine, and now the war, but the girl helped them with everything. At first it seemed to him that she became close to him only because she was sent to spy, but she is completely different. The young man asks the knight why he doesn't see Nadia, and he, chewing a piece of meat, says that the lady said that she was very tired and wanted to rest at home. The young lady is sitting in her room at this time. She is thinking about how she can quietly hint to the guy about the whereabouts of the dragon. The first option is that she will say that she accidentally found it while passing by, but its habitat is deep in the mountains. Therefore, the main character thinks about the possibility that my ancestor appeared to her in a dream and told her about it. But the girl understands that this is not very impressive, but suddenly she hears someone knocking on the door. The young lady thinks that she is already warned that she is resting and does not understand who it could be, but she says to come in. It turns out to be the Marquis. The girl says that she thought he was celebrating with everyone. You ask what brought him there. Glenn asks whether it was thanks to her that they were able to win, and whether she thinks it would be better to go out to the soldiers. The main character says that she thinks he is right. Then her husband extends his hand to her, and the young lady wonders whether he will accompany her and why he suggested it. The main character just calmly says that she's in trouble, the guy thinks what she's talking about, and the young lady just says with a smile that nothing and everything is fine. As they head down the corridor, the guy claims that he heard from Fabian that she was tired and wanted to rest in the room. But it turns out the girl was not sleeping. The young lady says that if that's what he's talking about, then she couldn't sleep thinking about new territories. After all, they finally got them, and of course she had to think about how to use them. The guy says this, and the young lady continues and says that the mine is of particular importance, because the production of iron ore will therefore increase. But suddenly she stumbles and almost falls, but her husband immediately catches the girl. Then the young lady thanks him and says that she seems too relaxed because she could stop worrying about him and his safety. And she herself thinks that it was unexpected why she twisted her leg, but what is more important? This is why his face is so close. The main character says that he can let her go already. Then the guy does so and tells her to be careful. The lady with brown hair thinks that he first offers to conduct, and now this, so it is noticeable that the atmosphere has somehow changed. When they enter the room with the knights, they are already completely drunk. One of them screams that Count Alteo's confused face was so funny. The young lady understands that it's like being at a market. The knights, seeing that their mistress has come, are surprised and immediately begin to sing for their mistress. The young lady smells the fumes wafting from them and is greeted. She understands that the knights are all in Susie. The girl, of course, knew that this would happen, which is why she did not want to come. Glenn says that they seem to be too happy about the end of the long war, so he asks the young lady to understand them. Then someone turns to the main character. It turns out to be Lord Giscard. He says he wants to say something. The young lady thinks that this is just it, because she wanted to point out something, so the girl says that she is listening to him. The man kneels in front of her and apologizes for doubting her. The main character definitely did not expect this. She calmly asks the Lord to stand up and claims that she understands perfectly why he did not trust her with them as he did, and said she was from the Balasith family, but she says that now she is with the Marquis's wife, and her reputation is Glenn's reputation, and the knight's bad behavior towards her is tantamount to damaging the reputation of their leader, whom they serve. The guy turns to his wife and says that Lord Giscard behaved this way out of deep devotion to their family, and he will be careful so that this does not happen again. Well, the young lady says that she will not assert her authority only at the expense of others, so she herself will inflict a worthy punishment on him. The Lord agrees and says that he understands perfectly well how much of a group he was with her, so he will gladly accept any punishment. The main character only says that it will be difficult for him to endure the punishment alone, but if you share it, the burden will not be so heavy. The knights are already a little scared. They ask what the lady is talking about. One of the knights thinks that he didn't even suspect that their lady was such a person. 
but the lady with brown hair only says that each of them will be punished, and everyone, without exception, must drink a penalty. The knights are completely shocked by this, and then they smile and say that they can handle this. Another knight says that the lady is also a joker. Nadia claims that she is glad that they are happy. She waves her hand to the maid and asks if she can bring what she asked for. Then the maid brings even more barrels of alcohol. The knights, shocked by this, do not ask the lady if she thinks it's too much. And besides, it's all quite strong alcohol. The young lady just smiles and says that this is how the penalty area should look. She then turns to the commander and says that she will personally pour it for him. The man thanks her. He understands that everyone took this situation as a joke, but it's not like that. After all, in this way the girl points out his rudeness, attracting the attention of the soldiers. Moreover, it forces everyone to remember that it is above them. The guy starts drinking alcohol and thinks that this girl is definitely not so simple, and perhaps a noble man has really appeared in the north. The young lady says to come next. Then the knight with black hair screams to be allowed, but the knight in front of him asks if he knows that he is standing in line. The young lady Lishu smiles and tells them not to worry because there is enough for everyone. Glenn watches his wife and can't help but smile. That same night, someone sneaks into the office with documents. It turns out to be the main character. She puts the piece of paper in the pile and says that everyone in this family and even the ancestors should thank her. A short time later, the girl screams that this document says about the dragon Rio. The servants are shocked by this. One of them says that they just received these lands, and here is such a disaster. The Marquis says that he said that everything went suspiciously smoothly, but because of the dragon they will not be able to get rid of these lands, so he says that they need to come up with something. The young lady says that it seems he shouldn't worry because it says there that the dragon's owner died a long time ago, and apparently Count Alteo only received the report and has not yet had time to start excavations, so all the rare items have been accumulated on the dragon now. The Marquis is shocked. He thinks why something good happens so often, because he has never been so lucky. The young lady looks at him and thinks that he must not believe in such great luck, and I think that, of course, it's all thanks to her. Then the young man asks how she read this document, and the knight adds that they also saw it, but decided to skip it because they did not make out Count Alteo's scribbles. The main character is shocked. She thinks that even though she wrote with her left hand, it's really so incomprehensible. Now, the young lady understands why no one said a word about him in four days. The young lady laughs and says that her father has a similar handwriting, and she has been accustomed to this since childhood, so it would be better not to quickly send him to a search party because it would be better to find out the extent of what is happening before returning to Winterfell. Glenn says that she only has different talents. The young lady does not understand what he is talking about, and he just turns around and orders Anils to quickly send a detachment in search of the dragon. A little time later, the guy stands on a hill and looks at the fertile lands that are now his property. But there is one problem. Anils turns to his master and says that I have enough farmers because of this. Most of the fields are idle. Due to the fact that Count Altea extracted large taxes from farmers who rented land, people began to die of starvation in the spring when there was not enough food, and eventually they simply fled the county. When the agricultural season begins, he will be able to strengthen his forces and prepare for civil war, but even if he forces those farmers to move to these lands, there will still not be enough workers in such open spaces. One of the servants turns to the master and asks how about bringing back the farmers who fled the county. After all, if he gives the order, he will lead the army and turn over all the surroundings. The peasants most likely created their own village and live in it. The young lady claims that if they force them to return, it will affect the reputation of the Marquis. She asks whether it would be better to use wandering people because then they can easily solve the problem of labor shortage. Glenn says it's not a bad idea, but will they want to settle there? Because even if he cuts taxes, they won't trust him so easily. Because from their point of view, Alteo is a terrible territory, and the truth only becomes obvious after time. The young lady is just silent, and the guy doesn't even know what she's thinking about again. After which he approaches her and says that Nadia must have an idea. The young lady understands that he himself is asking her opinion, but does not understand why. She asks if it is noticeable on her face. The girl claims that if he lends her his sword, she thinks she can solve this problem. Glenn asks why she needs a sword. He understands that this sword is the sword of the head, which is passed down in the Winterfell family from generation to generation, so what is the young lady going to do with it? Then the Marquis puts his hand on the sheathed sword and approaches her. The main character thanks him, but the guy just walks past her and hands the sword to the knight. 
Nadia turns around, not understanding what is wrong, and her husband only says that the sword is too heavy and it will be difficult for her to carry it, and Fabian will become her hands and feet, so let her just order him. The main character claims that she is not so weak, but the Marquis only says that then she seemed lighter to him than he thought. Nadia doesn't understand what he means. But then the realization comes to her that he may be talking about that day. Now the young lady understands that, as she thought, something has changed in Glenn. A short time later, two men are sitting in a diner. One of them asks if his interlocutor has heard about that story. Another gesture asks what he is talking about. Then the blonde says that the whole village is talking about it, but he still doesn't know the story about Peter and the ten bars of gold. A new owner appeared in the county of Alteo. The new head hung an interesting sign next to the gate of the fortress that whoever pulls the ball with his head will get ten gold bars. All the people wanted to get the gold, but no one could get the sword of the head. One woman from the village screamed that this was a test from the head, and this sword was not a simple one, but was the property of the head himself, and he was testing whether the new residents would dare to touch his things. Other villagers agreed. But that day, a brave young man appeared and cried out that he would try to pull out the head's sword, after which he did so, then one of the head servants came out to him. The villagers were a little worried about this, they were almost burying the young man. The Lord approached him and asked if he was the one who pulled out the chief's sword and then told him to kneel down, and accept the reward from the head, it was a chest with ten bars of gold. The leader's promises was heavily rewarded and lived happily, and that's the end of the story. The guy says that what happened is simply incredible, and his interlocutor says that the new head is different from Count Alteo, and he is not one of those who speak ambiguously. The man also claims that he heard that this story spread to other villages, and the Belong Fortress was again filled with peasants. But suddenly, one of the guys screams and offers a drink, because the new head has promised to greatly reduce taxes, so this year they will heal. Everyone in that diner is immensely happy about this, and at this time, the servants run up to the main character. One of them claims that the leader of the peasants is on his knees asking for permission to return. The second one reports on the repair of broken weapons. The lady with brown hair says okay with a smile. Glenn is watching his wife at this time. He thinks that the girl is so energetic, as if she is offended by her past life. He does not understand why she is sparing no effort in dealing with the affairs of Winterfell. Although the young lady says that it is because of her love for him, then why is she not interested in him at all? At this time, one servant bursts into the room. He says that they have finally found the diagram of the Balong Fortress. When they examine the plan, the Marquis claims that the walls are very strong, and inside the structure looks like a labyrinth. He claims that the previous owner was very careful, and this must be how he protected himself from the invasion of strangers. The young lady understands that they were the strangers. She thinks that the Belong Fortress is called the Iron Fortress, because there are a lot of secret places inside, and perhaps one of them contains a treasure hidden by Count Alteo, so you need to check everything. But to be honest, they have a goal that is more important than treasure, because in the past Alteo, together with the gnomes, sold high-quality steel objects. These were materials, weapons, and even household items. The young lady understands that they would greatly help in the development of Winterfell. Therefore, now with the plan of the fortress, she thinks that it seems that all the secret rooms have been found. But, unfortunately, there are no traces of the gnomes and even signs that they collaborated. Suddenly, the young lady bumps into her husband's back and asks for forgiveness because she was lost in thought. She asks Glenn what happened, but he just says that it's all somehow strange because the path is blocked, but there is a gap and the wall is a little shabby. The guy looks at it and puts his hand on it. He thinks that perhaps there is a passage behind it, and when he opens it, he sees a passage to the stairs inside. When the young lady goes there, she realizes that there is a room with a wall, no matter how much she looks, but she doesn't see any difference, so she wonders how he knew. The knight says that this place is not on the diagram, and it is somehow suspicious, and Glenn offers to go down. When the main character goes down the stairs, she sees traces of red liquid on the walls. And when they finally go down to the very bottom, they see a forge. Glenn wonders why Alteo would hide her in a place like this. The main character looks at the weapon. She takes one of the daggers in her hands and realizes that it is handmade. The young man comes up to her and says that it can be sent, so the girl better not touch anything there. The young lady says that's good and thanks for the advice. Glenn thinks that this is strange and that Alteo's weapons have always been of such high quality because this dagger is much stronger and lighter than their weapons. 
The knight turns to his master and says that he hears some sounds outside the door, and they are similar to the sounds of half-dead people. Then the Marquis approaches the door, and the young lady thinks that they have found a forge hidden in the dungeon and high-quality weapons. But what if there is something else behind this door? Glenn says that he will check and orders the knight not to leave the mistress. Fabian says that several days have passed since they took possession of the fortress. Are there really people left there? Well, what if they are not people, but ghosts? The young man tells him to just stand near the mistress, after which he kicks down the door and goes inside. The guy sees something similar to a prison there. Someone screams from the cage that he will do as the master orders and claims that he was wrong. When the Marquis approaches the cage, he sees several people chained there. He realizes that these are gnomes. The young lady sees red stains on their clothes and wonders what happened there and why they were chained in such a place. One of the gnomes asks to spare them. He screams that last time they committed a terrible sin, but Glenn only asks why they are there. Cannon asks if Count Alteo sent the guy. He claims that they just came to look at the human world, and that's true. The Marquis understands that his enemy also exploited the gnomes. The author asks the gentleman what they should do. Then the guy says that he will deal with this personally, the main character thinks about what he is talking about and becomes a little wary. Her husband knocks down the door and goes inside, reaching for his sword. The gnome is very scared by this, but the guy just swings his arms with a serious expression on his face. The main character is shocked by this. She immediately hugs her husband from behind and asks him to wait. The young man asks what she is doing, and Nadia says that they cannot be finished off because they are only victims who were exploited by Count Alteo. The dwarves are still in shock and Glenn asks why the girl thought about this. The young lady in shock asks if he wasn't going to do this, because if so, then why does he need a sword? But the guy with such a serious face swung his arms that you couldn't help but think about the worst. The young man only cuts the chains and says that he wanted to free them. The Marquis then claims that his name is Glenn, and he is the new head of the county. So the guy asks if they could tell what Alteo did to them, the dwarf looks at him and says that they themselves did not expect that everything would turn out this way. They wanted to see the world, and in this world try to create new things using resources and their skills. Thinking about this, they went outside, but no one was happy with them. People in the village only screamed that they were monsters. Another gnome told Mr. Miar that this was the last house, and maybe it would be better for them to go to another village. In addition, there was a sick baby with them, however, they were only busy running away from people, and no one helped them. Then they found themselves in the forest and tried to hide from the rain. She claimed that there was no sign that the rain would stop and asked what they should do. Miar thought that if this continued, not only the child would be in danger, but also everyone else. He thought there would be a place where they could hide from the rain for a while. Therefore, he claimed that he was going to the fortress, because if their lava lived there, then maybe he would take pity on them. Another dwarf said that he would also go with the master. Then Miar came to the fortress to the lord, and on his knees, asked to help them until the child's fever subsided. The owner of the fortress thought what an abomination he was, and he assumed that they had a serious matter, but it turned out that everything was completely wrong, so he thinks who let these beggars into the fortress, and then he asks the knight about it. He claims that the new guard did it, and the lord says that he doesn't need to know. Then he orders his hands to be cut off and driven out along with this brat. One of the gnomes begged the master not to kick them out, because they didn't have many things with them, but they would do everything and let him listen to them first. The knight just grabbed him by the collar and asked why he was so persistent, which made the dwarf's cup fall out of his hands. The count, when he picked it up, told the knight to leave them. He did not understand where they got such a precious thing from, and they probably stole it. Therefore, the guy says that it is very suspicious that they have such a rare thing. He asks if the gnome stole it, and they say that the Lord misunderstood everything, and they made this cup themselves. Alteo doesn't know where they came from, but they seem to have skills, and if they are good at something, they can be useful. This is how the dwarves were able to get into the fortress. Alteo said they can stay there while they do whatever he says. He locked them in the basement to protect them from possible threats, we didn't mind, because we still wanted to stay there until the child recovered. However, when Miar thanked the Lord for everything he had done and said that the child had left so they were leaving, Alteo's reaction surprised him. The Lord said that he picked them up too, and they were so ungrateful, he asked if they wanted to leave the fortress and said that this was nonsense. Mir asks, didn't he himself say that they can stay there until the baby gets better if I do everything he wants? After all, they no longer need to stay there. The guy looked at the weapon and said that as the head of the territory, 
he is obliged to protect the local residents, and if people like them break into your village, then it will be a disaster. While staying there, they learned how to make weapons, so how can he know what they will do with this knowledge after leaving the fortress? Then the Lord says that he must deal with them. Miar thinks about what he was talking about and really didn't think of letting them go from the very beginning. Another dwarf says that all this time he did not give them any food or time to rest. He grabs a hammer and asks what Alteo is talking about now. The head of the gnome screams at Dihi not to do this, but the Lord only knocks the hammer out of the dwarf's hands, causing him to fall. The head of the gnomes immediately runs up to his relative. The man asks how he can let go of those who tried to harm even their benefactor. Now Mir says that after this, the new owner of the lands found them imprisoned and dying of hunger. Glenn says that it would be better if they found them earlier, but he tells us that it's not their fault, and only that person is to blame for everything. The guy claims that he will compensate them for everything they experienced and will provide treatment until they fully recover. Miar says that they don't need money, and that's not why he told him everything. She tells us that they will happily accept treatment and return to where they came from. The main character looks a little sad. She understands that these are people who do not belong to this world and who were never accepted, and besides, they betrayed their faith. The young lady seems to understand well how they are feeling right now, so she must do something to prevent them from ending up in the same situation as her. The girl claims that it would be a pity if they just returned so easily, because they went out to see the world, but so far they haven't really seen it, because this world is so huge. Therefore, the young lady with a smile on her face invites them to come with them. She claims that she will show them the scale of this world in Winterfell, and they will experience it together. The dwarf is trying to object to something. He thinks that if it is the same there, no one will be near them, and they will be forced to work again. But Nadia just leans towards him and says that she guarantees that no one else will kidnap them or ban them. She also says that they will pay them and provide them with vacation, so that they can explore all the territories to their fullest. She says that of course she does not force them, and if they don't want to, they can refuse. But she would be very happy if they lived in them, because their lands need talented craftsmen like them. The girl thinks that in the past, she would also like to be comforted like that, in a house in which no one needed her. Miar wonders if they need them, and Glenn says he thinks the same. He says that he understands well that they are afraid that this could happen again, but he claims that they don't have to worry, because he, as the new head, guarantees them freedom and security. The dwarves look at each other, and then their leader turns around and says that everyone seems to think the same thing. Then the Marquis extends his hand to him and says that this is a good decision, and first they must be cured, and then they will talk about where they will live. The guy says he will take care of them. A short time later, a knight bursts into the room of the Marquis and Marquise, he screams to the master that they have completed the check of the iron ammunition. As the lady said, they are incredible and invites the gentleman to just look at this quality. The Marquis says that he said to test them and not to put them on himself, and the knight says that in any case the result is good. He asks how the young lady thought of this, but it always turns out as she says. The main character understands that, to be honest, these are not her ideas, but she says that she had been thinking about it for a long time, but there was no chance to check it, and then they hired gnome craftsmen and found iron ore. Everything was perfect to try. Nadia realizes that iron armor is much stronger than regular armor, but this will become known later. Based on someone's future, the young lady knows about everything only because she has already lived it. Glenn turns to his wife and says that if they can distribute such armor to others, their army's defense will increase a hundredfold. The main character says that of course she wanted to do that. She claims that she ran there for this purpose, and when they return to Winterfell, they can also improve the weapons. The guy thinks his wife is the one whose thoughts he can't read. The young lady thinks that everything is ready. She drinks tea and realizes that the money received from the dragon and the thorny vine, territory and food in the Rhine region, and an army fully equipped with iron armor and weapons. Soon, this place will be able to catch up with the South. The girl thinks that the Duke and her sister will face sad last moments of their lives, Someone tells the lady that he is coming in. It is Fabian who says that he brought the product she was talking about. The main character thanks him, and the guy says that he found the most famous master in the Rhine. He asks if the girl knows how hard it was to do it. He also asks why the lady needs this, because he doesn't think that she will use it herself. The young lady claims that it is for a gift. She thinks this is the first time she is preparing a gift for someone. 
In her past life, she did not have a single person whom she could take care of, and naturally, she also did not receive gifts from anyone. But if you think about it, he did give her something once. The girl remembers how her sister screamed at how annoying this was to her, and why the maid's daughter gets more attention than her. It was the day when Karen was angry with her sister as usual, and all because the dress she wore to the ball attracted more attention than her outfit. She herself threw the dress to her as a sop. The young lady thought that if she remained silent, she would soon calm down. Well, the blonde just screamed whether her sister was ignoring her. Nadia thinks that Karen always took out her anger on her, and at some point she resorted to assault. So the girl was waiting for this, and then the husband of the main character passed by. And when he noticed this action, he grabbed the blonde by the hand. He asked what Lady Karen was doing now. The blonde told him not to interfere and to go where he was going, because this was the sister's private business. The brunette asks if this is personal, and then turns to the young lady and says that then he too may have a private matter with her, after which he takes the main character by the hand and says that he needs Lady Nadia. The lady with brown hair did not understand what was happening and told Lord Ji Ho to wait, but he only continued to lead her along. The blonde was left alone in the room, and this couple went to a restaurant. Ji Ho claimed that Nadia really suits red. The main character thanked him. She thought that he suddenly gave her a new dress and invited her to dinner. Even though they were spouses, even when they clashed, they didn't really talk to each other. The guy just says that this place is popular among lovers and asks if the young lady has ever been there. Nadia said that she sat at home all the time and did not have the opportunity. And now she understands why there are so many people there. The young man points to the food and says that he talks too much, so he will leave the girl to try it before it gets cold. The main character agrees. And when he tries the dish, he thinks how delicious it is. The brunette says that he is glad. They always said from TV series that the most important thing on the first date is food. The young lady asks what he is talking about and suggests that he eat quickly. And she herself thinks about what series he's talking about. The guy claims that he is finished and he likes how well Nadia eats. The main character thinks that if you look, the most important option is how they look in front of others. She remembers how her sister said that Lord Ji Ho probably doesn't know how to use cutlery because they are on the same level with him. She laughed and said that it was the first time she had seen a knife handled so ignorantly. The young lady now understands that if she saw Lord Ji Ho's inept table etiquette, most would judge him. The person with brown hair says that her question may seem rude, but she wonders if she can still ask it. Lord says of course she can. Then the main character says that he is not used to table etiquette. She says she didn't want to ruin his mood, and he just came from another world, so it seemed to her that this could happen. The guy clenches his fist and says that everything is true. He claims that no one watched him in his house, so he ate as he pleased. But apparently when others see him eat, they make fun of not only him, but also the young lady. The main character is a little shocked by this. She offers if he doesn't mind teaching him. After they have eaten, they go home. The guy says that he had a great time thanks to her, and this place really is as incredible as they say. After which, the young man asks that he wants to ask something. He states that he is very embarrassed, but then asks if the girl has ever experienced discrimination. The main character asks what he is talking about, and he adds that he is interested in discrimination among the nobles. The brunette says that he thought in this world, only strangers like him are treated differently. And the main character understands that if you think about it, he's right. Even though he has outstanding abilities, he is ignored just because he is an outsider and was even forced to marry his illegitimate daughter. The young lady was born into this world, and although she is not loved, everyone knows whose blood flows in her, and there is only one guy in this world. Therefore, the main character says that it must be hard for him. The brunette is silent at first, and then he takes her hand in his and says that she should feel the same way. He asks if the girl wants to meet again, and says that he will tell her how to read the stars. Nadia asks if there is a special way for this. The guy says that, of course, and if you look at the stars for a long time, you can find out a lot, such as the weather, the terrain, and the right time for farming. The main character asks if this is what they teach in their world, and says that it is quite interesting. Then the brunette asks if she can come to their next meeting in the clothes that he gave her. The young lady smiles and agrees. Now she thinks she has succumbed to useless memories. Therefore, the girl tries to forget it, because no matter what happened, in the end, he also betrayed her. He hurt her just as much as she trusted him. The guy is sitting at this time, looking at the stars and thinking about Nadia. 
At this time, the Duke in his office cannot calm down. He hits the table and cries out whether the Marquis of Winterfell has captured the Belong Fortress. He screams what this idiot Alteo did that the fortress was taken away from him. O Servant says that it seems Winterfell dug a tunnel under the fortress and blew it up. The Duke is shocked. He thinks how the Marquis was able to find out the exact location of the soft rocks to destroy the walls. But suddenly he realizes that Glenn could not know such secret information. He thinks that after Nadia married the Marquess, Winterfell has always been lucky, and is it really just a coincidence? The Duke understands that near the Belong Fortress are the most fertile lands of the Rhine, and this is a place that can withstand the South. He realizes that it has remained untouched by Alteo since they periodically opposed Winterfell in the wars. The blonde asks if there has been any news from his daughter, but the servant claims that there is no, and the First Lady never contacted them. Well, isn't it good that Lord Ho succeeded in Gadabir's military campaign? Because now everyone in the capital is talking about him. They even gave him the nickname Dragon Hunter. This says that this is true and makes me happy that at least he is fulfilling his role. But the blonde has a bad feeling, and he understands that he must find out everything for sure. He tells rumors to bring paper for writing because he must find out about the well-being of his daughter, whom he has not seen for a long time. Glenn, at this time, is heading somewhere on horseback. The knights inform their master that the outskirts of Winterfell are finally visible. This outskirts is the village of Topu, and the poor live there. The residents there shout joyfully because the master has returned. Residents see fruit in one of the carts. The woman says how many expensive fruits there are, and her son asks what it is and says that they are so bright and look very tasty, so he wants to try it. The main character gets out of the carriage. She takes one of the apples and hands it to the boy. The girl with a smile on her face claims that today they don't have much of it, but soon they will be able to eat it all the time. The child, in shock, asks if they are really giving him this precious fruit, and then thanks the lady. Glenn offers to rest for a short time in this village. He understands that only a few months ago, hunger made it difficult to see a smile on their faces. But in a short time, the situation improved. The guy understands that when they return to the mansion, he should properly thank Nadia. But then the girl turns to him and says that the day has come when they return to the mansion. The young lady says with a smile on her face that time flies very quickly. The guy looks at her a little in shock. The lady with brown hair wonders why he was staring at her like that and wonders if she has something on her face. She says she just wanted to tell him something before they left and states that when they arrive at Winterfell, there will be a procession. The young man doesn't even listen. He thinks why he didn't notice this before, that the girl is quite beautiful. He realizes that she is not at all like her father. He, of course, thought that she was not bad-looking, but the young lady pulls him out of his thoughts and asks if Glenn is listening to her. He immediately apologizes and says that he's lost his mind. Nadia then claims that she was talking about the ceremony of returning to Winterfell and his place in the procession. The guy puts his hand on his head and says that he already forgot, and then says that she will enter the territory with him. The young lady remembers something important and says that she wanted to tell him earlier, but I wouldn't want to catch my eye, so it's better for her to stay in the cart. The young man asks what she is talking about because success in this war is her merit, and she is owed accordingly. But the main character interrupts him, and says that if rumors spread that she returned with him on the same horse, then won't her father begin to suspect her, because they might start calling her a double spy. She claims that the day will come when they will use what her father trusts her, so it is suggested that she keep this opportunity. The guy with silver hair puts his hand on his head, and says that there is no need to come to this, because it is true that he and the Duke of Balisith are political opponents, but isn't he the girl's family? He claims that he never asks her to stab her family members in the back, and he will never involve her in his relationship with the duchy. But Nadia objects. She says that in the near future, a serious confrontation will begin between the North and South, and she thinks that Glenn himself guesses about this. She claims that if she suddenly had to choose between the two of them, she would choose Glenn. The guy is shocked by this, but then he turns away and says that maybe she thinks so now, but if the girl harms her family with her own hands, it will become a scar for life. And in other words, he's not going to drag her into the war between them. The main character thanks the Marquis for such words, and claims that it is not difficult for her to help them. The young lady, a little shyly, says that she likes Glenn and wants to help the man she loves. The guy is embarrassed by this, but then immediately turns away. He wonders if all Southern girls admit their feelings so easily. He says that he understood the girl, and it's time to go so let her get into the carriage. The young lady says fine, and adds that they will see each other later. 
and she herself wonders if the guy was just embarrassed. She thinks that the more she looks at him, the nicer he becomes. At this time, in the mansion, a woman asks if the butler can leave her a seal and whether he will really behave like that. The man apologizes and says that he cannot treat his mistress's seal so carelessly, but the woman only turns to Gordon and says that just a couple of months ago she managed the mansion's housekeeping and, to be more precise, she is also the butler, but now the man does not trust her. Gordon says that he is grateful to her for her help, but that was then, and now a mistress has appeared at the Winterfell mansion. The woman smiles and says this, which only means that now the mansion has a real owner. She claims that the truth cannot be hidden, and servants whisper everywhere that the Marquise has not been seen for several days. Therefore, the woman turns to Gordon and invites him to say, when his mistress leaves her place so irresponsibly, who should take over the family household? The butler is a little shocked by this, but the woman continues and asks if he thinks it's too suspicious that she disappeared when Glenn left, and she must have escaped while she had the opportunity, because the woman is sure that a misfortune happened in Winterfell. Then she asks if the butler forgot that the girl is from the Balazit family, but he doesn't answer, and then he says that he understands her concern, and he didn't want to say it, but the lady is now with the master. The woman, in shock, asks, since when has she been with Glenn, and then shouts that even if that is the case, it doesn't make her any less suspicious. And who knows what trump cards she has up her sleeve. The butler says that this is possible, but as for the housekeeping, the lady will personally deal with him. The woman is in complete shock. She thinks what this girl did that the butler is unquestioningly on her side. She screams how Glenn still hasn't sent her back because she was definitely in his way. Gordon says that he doesn't know this, and they will be back soon, so let her ask the master herself. The woman asks what he is talking about, and he claims that the Marquis will return home soon. At this time, Glenn returns to his mansion, and everyone congratulates him on his victory. His aunt also meets him, and says how relieved he is to return safely. The guy asks his aunt if she came out to meet him, and claims that she has returned. The woman just says with a smile on her face that this is incredible and truly a huge achievement. She also says that the Marchioness also came with him, and how good it is that everything is fine with her. The woman says that she was very surprised to hear that she left the mansion and went to war, because how can a girl go to such a dangerous place? She looks at the young lady and decides to listen to how she will justify herself. But the girl only innocently says that she simply missed the Marquis so much that she could no longer stand it. Aunt Marquise just thinks what nonsense this is, and the knights behind say how romantic it is. Glenn is a little embarrassed, and the woman thinks what kind of vile girl this is, because she decided to get out of the situation like that. Therefore, the aunt says that if the girl loves the Marquis so much, she should have thought about his position, because did she really not realize that her presence on the battlefield could only hinder him? The young lady only sadly replies that her aunt is right and she is so stupid. Well, suddenly someone turns to a woman, auntie sees him, and thinks that such a devoted person as Giscard will definitely say something necessary, because he has accumulated dissatisfaction due to the fact that she came to the military camp and in this case, he will say something caustic. But he only tells Mrs. Grace to watch her words, because there are many eyes there, so let her be kind to the Marquise. The woman is completely shocked by such words, and the man continues and says that the Marquise put herself in danger because she was worried about her master, and on the battlefield she was responsible, so Mrs. Grace need not worry. The woman doesn't even know what to say. She understands that now it is not someone else, but Giscard himself protecting Balazit's daughter. Other knights say that this is true, and aren't they newlyweds? And another knight says that when the master met the lady, he regained his strength. The woman thinks that they are all out of their minds, and yet recently everyone ignored her because they considered Balazit a spy. Glenn turns to his aunt. He says that even though they are relatives, his wife is now the mistress of Winterfell, so let his aunt not forget basic things. The woman understands that Glenn is going there too, and the guy claims that they are tired after a long journey, so they will go first. After that, the two of them leave, and the aunt understands that Glenn is covering for Balazit's daughter, and he shamed her, and it's obvious that something is wrong there. The woman understands that if everything goes like this, the girl will finally take all the power. And when she seizes power, and even gives birth to an heir, her position will weaken, and her aunt cannot allow this. The main character lies down on the bed. She thinks how tired she is, and they say that playing a lover is much harder than winning a war. But she thinks about it, and it seems to her that Glenn has softened towards her. And besides, the people of Winterfell took her side so quickly, she did not expect this. The voice of one of the servants comes from behind the door, 
the maid asks the lady if she can warm up the water for her bath, and the young lady tells her to do so, and then asks Reese if she will come in for a minute, after which the girl hands the maid the jewelry. The girl asks the lady what it is, and the main character says that the Rhine region, located in the Belong Fortress, is famous not only for the production of iron ore, but also glass. The young lady claims that she brought it thinking about the maids. She says to give the jewelry to Yuri and Aiden too. The maid asks how there can be such valuable things for them, and Nadia claims that they are so valuable because these are not jewelry, but just glassware. The lady with brown hair says that when she first arrived in Winterfell, they helped her a lot, so the girl wants to pay them. Now the main character understands that she realized one thing when she returned to the past. This is that you shouldn't try to look better for people who hate you anyway, and where this time is better spent taking care of your people and your environment. The maid thanks the mistress, after which she and the other maids talk while heading to the bathroom. One of them says that this is the first time he has met such a mistress. She is so kind and caring. Another maid says that according to the butler, she is very good at her duties. However, the maid is a little worried about something. She asks what's wrong with the master, and is he really not at all interested in their mistress? After all, they still use different rooms today, and the lady, out of longing for him, even went to the Belong Fortress. The other maid says that this is true because their mistress is so beautiful and has a good character, and where else can one find such a mistress? Another maid says that the young lady, although she doesn't show it, seems to be heavy on her soul, because the last time he refused to spend her wedding night with her, she cried so much. Then the girl with brown hair asks what about this idea. The main character is in the bathroom at this time. When she is immersed in warm water, she realizes that she was thinking why today it took longer to prepare the bath. It turns out that they paid more attention since she was gone for a long time. The young lady relaxes and thinks that her fatigue has vanished, but then someone else comes into the bathroom. The young lady turns around and wonders if the maids have come to serve, but when she sees someone, she is surprised. After all, the one who entered turns out to be the Marquis. The girl in shock asks Glenn if it is. She thinks what else is it. The guy claims that he also doesn't know how this happened, but he was told to use this bathroom because it needed repairs. The young lady seems to understand what happened. She remembers how the maid said the lady would trust her, but she just thought that the maid was simply approaching her work responsibly. The girl thinks that this is the first time she has seen Glenn so embarrassed. She says that it seems the servants were playing a joke on them. The girl asks if he will go into the room and wait a little, because she will soon finish and leave, and the Marquis claims that he will make sure that the culprits are punished. The young lady says that there is no need to do this, because they did it with bad intentions and were just thinking about her. Then the guy says that he will go and turns around. The main character then sighs. The young man suddenly stops and wonders if he seemed so emotionless that they had to resort to such a thing, after which he turns around, and then sit in the bath next to his wife. The main character is completely shocked by this, and the guy is only a little embarrassed. The young lady asks if he has decided not to leave, but he only says that if he leaves now, rumors will spread that he rejected her again, and she will be in a difficult position. The young lady wonders if he is thinking about her now. Then she smiles and tells him to stay a little and go out. The main character thinks that there is nothing wrong with this, and he is so cute when he tries. The girl says that since it happened like this, Maybe they will help each other wash like real spouses. The guy turns around a little embarrassedly and says that it's not that he doesn't want it. And the main character only draws attention to a scar and asks when it appeared and then stretches out her hand. The Marcus tells her to wait and the young lady apologizes and asks if she was too close. But he only becomes even more embarrassed and asks why she doesn't keep her distance at all in such a situation. The young lady says that she was just worried because it seemed like the guy was in a lot of pain the young man thinks that it would be better if he just went out. After all, he can't help but look at her. Then Nadia offers to just talk. She says that so much has happened during this time, and the Marquis says that, come to think of it, he never formally thanked her. But thanks to her, the lands of Winterfell became much richer, because these lands were always limited in resources and did not have enough food and minerals. But now there is, and even a powerful army. The guy says that he is sincerely grateful to her, the main character just smiles and says that you're welcome. She understands that for the first time someone recognized her, and this makes her soul so happy. She also thanks Glenn, and he asks why. Then the girl replies that he married her. This makes the guy even more embarrassed. The next day, the two of them have a meal at the table. The maids are whispering. One of them says that it seems they had a great time together yesterday, 
and the second says that they were in the bathroom until dawn. The main character is happy because she slept and took a bath, and now she is eating her meal with a smile on her face. But for some reason, the Marquis could not sleep after eating. He gets up from the table and says that today is the day to inspect the territory. One of the maids tells the gentleman that he and his lady can go to inspect the territories. Glenn just remains silent, and the girl adds that he hasn't been there for a long time, and besides, today, a huge market has opened there, and there is something to see. The young lady is a little puzzled by this. She thanks Risa for her concern, but claims that she too must deal with the matters she has been putting off today. The Marquis only extends his hand to her and invites her to go together, after which they find themselves at the market. Nadia says she heard that there were a lot of people there, but she didn't think it was that many. The guy says that the Rhine regions have joined Winterfell. But suddenly, the young lady is pushed by one of the passing people, and others seeing her ask if this is not the madam, the second resident of the village says that she just looks like her because the madam would not wear such cheap clothes. The woman asks if he thinks so, and there is another person behind him. He looks at the main character with an empty and at the same time furious gaze. Glenn says that since there are a lot of people there today, it could be dangerous, and it seems that even the guards have already gotten lost in the crowd, so he suggests returning home, and then again. But suddenly that same man runs towards them. He screams that this is Balazit's offspring, and it's all because of her, but suddenly the Marquis stands in front of his wife to protect her, and then he immediately settles the guy on the ground. He asks with a cold look who he is. The guy lying on the ground tells the master that she is the daughter of Balasith, the worst enemy of the North, so he should not allow himself to be fooled. After all, because of her damn family, his brother died. The resident screams that they don't know how to fight normally, so they also put their soldiers on the front line. The main character is horrified by this. One of the residents asks what is happening. Two ladies whisper that it seems his brother died because of the Balazit family. One of them says that it is of course true that they have bad relations with the South, but is it really the lady's fault? Because the girl sacrificed so much for Winterfell. But suddenly, one woman screams from the crowd. She immediately falls to her knees and asks the gentleman for forgiveness. The woman says that her son made a huge mistake. She claims that he was always a sickly child and stayed at home. And after the death of his only brother, on whom he could rely, he still cannot come to his senses, so she asks the master to spare him. The woman claims that her first son, Henry Clark, died on the Calia expedition, and it is not the lady's fault. She claims that she knows that for desecrating her mistress's honor, there is a serious punishment. But in memory of her first son, she asks him not to do this. Glenn is silent for a moment and then lets the guy go. He says that he remembers Henry Clark. The woman does not understand what he is talking about, and the Marquis continues his speech. He claims that the guy was the one who fought braver than others on the front lines for Winterfell. He also says that the young man died as a hero, then that guy cannot hold back his tears and his mother too. At this time, the main character approaches the Marquis and says that everything is fine with her, so she asks me to make a problem out of it. She says that the truth is absolutely fine, and the Marquis turns around and says that since his wife says that she's fine, he'll get away with it. He leans over to the woman and puts his hand on her shoulder, and then claims that it must have been hard for her. The woman only thanks the lady with tears in her eyes, and then leaves with her son. The young lady thinks that for some time she forgot how strong the hatred of people for Balazit is there, and this is understandable, because her father did a lot of things, and solving only a couple of their problems the situation will not improve much. That same evening, the main character is sitting behind papers, but then a servant turns to her and says that it is already very late and it's time to rest. The young lady asks if so much time has passed. She then says that she is fine and they will do some more work and they can go, but Anil says that anyway. However, the main character interrupts him and says that she doesn't want to sleep yet, but promises that she won't stay up long so they shouldn't worry. The servants look at each other and then ask to be excused and leave. On the way, one of them says that he is really grateful that the lady is trying so hard for the sake of the residents, but isn't she overdoing it? Well, another says that she looks like someone who needs something to immerse herself in. Glenn is training with a sword at this time. He beheads one of the mannequins and then looks at him furiously. The Marquis remembers that guy at the market and understands that the server's losses were huge because Balazit put their people on the front line during the expedition, but that's not all. He swings his sword at the dummy again, and he thinks that the Duke is also an enemy of his parents, and Nadia is his daughter, but all this evil was done by her father, not she, because Nadia helps them, and if not for her help, 
Winterfell would not be able to prosper so much, and the girl is not their enemy. Anna, on the contrary, is a blessing. However, the fact that she is a member of the Balazit family has not disappeared anywhere, and she must also have enjoyed the way I saved his parents and went through innocent people. But then he throws away the sword and puts his hand to his head. Then the knights come to the training ground and say that Sir is early today. One of them claims that recently he has been constantly mistress, and he was not visible there. But his face has become so prettier, and is it really because he is newly wed? But then the guy with bags under his eyes turns to them, and the knight says that he takes it back. He asks where the lady is, and if everything is okay with her, then the knights gather in a semicircle and begin to gossip. One of them says that the guy was so gloomy when they mentioned the mistress before, and the second says that their master is such a mess in these matters. Then the third asks if he still hasn't accepted the mistress's feelings. The young man looks away, and the knights claim that everything seems to be so. One of them turns to the master and says that no matter how passionate love is, someday feelings cool down, and if he continues in the same spirit, he will regret it later. The knight with green hair asks if he thinks that there will be at least someone else who will love him so sincerely, because the mistress's feeling is real. The knight with red hair asks where else in the world there are girls like the lady, and the fact that the Marquis is her type is his highest blessing. The Marquis says that he himself knows. He says Nadia is too good for him. Then the knights agree and say that this is true, because she is smart, beautiful, and more importantly, she sincerely loves her husband. Then the knight asks his master what the problem is. Otherwise, he thinks that if he loves her, what will happen to his mother and his bedridden father? The guy is not going to blame Nadia for her father's crimes. But to love the daughter of the one who destroyed your mother is a different question, so he cannot accept her feelings. He thinks that they should not do this. Then Fabian runs up to the Marquis. He says that the lady is inviting the gentleman to have lunch together. If he is not busy, then he could come over. The Marquis is a little surprised by this proposal, but joins the meal. When they have lunch, they do it in silence. The main character thinks that he seems to still be thinking about this, about what happened then. She says that she understands that the residents do not trust her because they know why her father has a bad reputation. But if suddenly the Marquis is worried about her, he may not do this. But the guy just suggests not to talk about it. The young lady thinks that they can't just leave it like that, and she would really like to defuse the situation. Therefore, he tells Glenn that they are married, and if something happens, then wouldn't it be better to talk about it? She asks if he remembers how she said that she would choose him if the choice came between him and her father. The girl also says that she said this for a reason, to be honest with her father. But the Marquis just screams in satisfaction. The main character is shocked by this, and the young man understands what he has done. He immediately puts his hand on his head and apologizes. He says he didn't mean to get angry. The main character just smiles and says that everything is fine. She understands that he is worried. So when Glenn is ready to talk, let her know. She says a little sadly that she will wait, but the guy thinks that it's not all because of her, and she is simply the daughter of the one who killed his mother. But despite this, he likes her. The Marquis understands that he himself is to blame. The young lady then heads down the corridor to her room, but Fabian catches up with her. He screams for the lady to wait for him. The girl asks what's the matter, and the knight says that the gentleman seems to have upset her because all he did all day was train and didn't even go into the office. The young lady just looks a little sad after these. The knight asks to listen, and asks if the lady knows about the disaster that happened to his parents. The girl understands that he is talking about the fall of the cart from the mountain ridge in which the Marquise died. Glenn's mother died, and his father still cannot leave from a serious wound. The knight says that the culprit of this disaster was the young lady's father. The main character says that she understands. The girl knows about this because her father clearly hated the Marquis and did not hide it at all. The knight adds that the gentleman suffers greatly because he fell in love with the daughter of the one who harmed his parents, and it seems that because of what happened in the village, his suffering only intensified. Fabian claims that he wants to say that this is in no way because of her, and nothing can be done in this situation, so he tells the lady not to blame herself. The girl just smiles and thanks the knight, and then goes into her room. The young lady thinks that it's not that she didn't understand why the people in Winterfell consider her father their enemy. But still, it wasn't he who killed her mother and wounded Glenn's father. In her past life, the girl personally heard this from him. The blonde claimed that it seemed that the Marquis had many enemies within his territory, although this happens to any family. 
a lady with brown hair asked if her father had anything to do with this tragedy, but he only asks if she thinks that he would use such a cheap trick and says that if his hand had been involved in this, then no one would be left alive. Moreover, if the Marquis dies, won't his son Glenn take his place? Because he is much better than his father, and the Duke cannot read his thoughts. If Glenn officially takes the place of head of Winterfell, then they will only become exponentially stronger. Therefore, the blonde asks why he should help with this. The young lady understands that she also heard that the Marquis's body was already stiff, and she does not think that these are the consequences of the accident. After all, people in the South would not act without their father's decree, so they have nothing to do with it, and that means someone else is behind this, as the father said. And a traitor among his own may be the one who could easily enter the Marquis's bedroom and the one who was unquestioningly trusted. The main character understands that she must find the real criminal, because if a civil war breaks out in the future, she must gather all her strength and cannot turn a blind eye to problems within the state. But she doesn't understand how, because despite everything she has done for them, she still cannot convince the people. But suddenly, someone calls the lady. It turns out to be a maid. She says that she has just arrived with a letter from the Duchy of Balazit. The girl looks at the letter, which says that it is intended for his beloved daughter, and writes in her hearts that after she left, the house was completely empty, and maybe she will write to him more often, as they agreed before she left. The young lady understands that in appearance, this is an ordinary letter, but by writing letters, he definitely means conveying information, and any reasonable person will immediately be able to understand this hidden meaning. The young lady thinks that if anyone sees this, they might think that she is in cahoots with her father, so she thinks how could he send such a letter so easily? After all, he must be giving her a warning so that she sends him information about Winterfell's weak point. The maid asks if the lady wants to write an answer and prepare a paper for her, but the young lady says no, and she wants to think about the answer. Nadia understands that she cannot leave everything as it is. At this time, Aunt Marquise is surprised. She asks if Glenn really stopped going to that girl. One of the servants says that he has heard that the master has only been busy with work lately, and there is ongoing talk that their relationship has cooled. It seems that the fact that one of the local residents attacked the lady with the words that she was a spy became a problem, and they say that this man's brother was a valuable soldier of the master. The woman just smiles hearing this. She says that there is a chance, even though the Marquis seems to be in love with this girl. Grace thinks that usually all doubts begin to grow from something insignificant, and if they grow tied to the death of his mother, then it will be much easier to shake him. The servant claims that the Marquis is already going too far, and at first he entrusted household chores to his mistress, and now, as soon as she appears, she immediately runs away and this can no longer continue. The guy claims that he can no longer calmly watch as the Winterfell family passes into the hands of Balasith. The woman tells him not to worry and to leave it all to her, after which she gets up from the sofa and sit down at the table with paper. Auntie thinks that no matter how outstanding this girl is, she will not last even a year there. After which she writes a letter, and you think that the young lady, who knows who from this family is her people. She then hands the black-haired young man a paper and tells him with a grin to hand it over. She also tells him not to forget to tell him to burn the letter as soon as he reads it. Glenn trains again in the morning. This time it's archery. He hits the target with one precise shot. The main character watches him from behind. She thinks that she needs to sort out this awkwardness between them for the sake of the future. She is worried that he has again become afraid of her. Therefore, the girl approaches her husband and asks if he can teach her, and the guy asks what. Then she looks at the bow in her hand and wonders if she really wants to learn how to shoot from it. Nadia asks if she can, but she just turns around without saying a word. The young lady understands that, as she thought, he is again uncomfortable with her, but he only says that newcomers use this, and he takes out a simple onion from the box. The main character smiles in response to this and takes the bow in her hands. The guy tells her to insert the arrow and pull the string. Nadia, with shaking hands, asks if she is doing it right. Well, the guy just comes up to her and straightens her into a stance. He says that it's better to put your legs wider. And it's better for the girl to stand straight and not bend her body. After which he tells her to pull the bowstring to the limit and helps her with this. The young lady is embarrassed by this, but when she shoots the arrow, it just falls. The young man says that in order to get used to it, he will have to try and if she wants, then he will set aside time for practice. Then the main character thanks him, and the guy talks about what happened last time. 
Nadia asks if he is still worried about this because she is really fine, but then, blushing a little, he thanks her for today. The main character with a sincere smile on her face says that you're welcome. A little time later, one of the maids heads into the garden. She looks around so that no one follows her. And then she finds her basket with sewing material in the bushes. She also thinks it's good that no one found it. After which the girl begins to embroider. She thinks how dark it is. But suddenly, someone screams out who she is. It turns out to be one of the knights. He asks what Adi is doing so late at night. The girl asks why he is there at such a time. The guy claims that the lady asked him to heat the room, so he is looking for firewood. But suddenly, he notices that the young lady's threads and needles are falling out from behind, so he asks if she works part-time in secret. The guy asks whether close maids can do part-time work, because they are paid twice as much for taking care of just one person. He immediately grabs the maid by the hand and screams to come with him, because everyone should know what she is doing. He claims that her mistress should be asleep by now, but Mistress Grace is still in the main house. The girl asks Jacob to wait and not do this, because when she receives the money, she will share it with him. But the knight just screams if she wants him to get in trouble for this, and then tells her not to talk nonsense and go, after which he throws it into Mrs. Grace's room. The woman asks what the noise is late at night, and the guy says that this maid serves the mistress, but she secretly does sewing as an additional income. Instead of taking care of her mistress at night, she did other things. Jacob says that the mistress should kick her out of the mansion. The young lady, hearing this, is horrified. She says mistress that she didn't give her mistress, and just. But the woman just looks at her and asks what she is talking about. And the blonde continues and says that she needs money. Her salary is not enough for expensive medicines for a loved one. The woman just clicks and asks what kind of medicine is so expensive, and the girl says that along with it comes out to about one gold coin. Grace just bends over to the girl and asks if the Marquise can take care of her own out loud. And then he hands the girl a bag of money. She says that this should be enough to pay for the medicine. The next day, the young lady greets Mistress Grace with a smile. The woman says that they have not seen the Marquise for a long time. She also claims that lunch is just over, and she is already at work. The young lady says it's her own business, and she writes a response letter to her father. The woman says that perhaps she disturbed her, but the main character says that not at all, and this is not such an urgent matter, so she invites her aunt to sit down. Well, the girl thinks what happened, because that woman is not one of those who can come to her first. Grace just sits down and claims that she came today to apologize. The young lady does not understand why she decided to do this so suddenly. And the woman says that, to be honest, she thought that the girl was a spy pursuing her goal. But she so selflessly took care of Winterfell, and she heard the conversations of the knights and realized that she was mistaken. Grace says that she is very sorry that she did not recognize the young lady's sincerity and was so rude, and then asks if the girl will accept her apology. The main character immediately replies that, of course, she will do it, and the woman is a little shocked because she did not expect such a reaction. Nadia just smiles and says that she is so glad that she spoke about this. After all, for her she is the same aunt as for Glenn, and from now on she can feel comfortable. The woman says that she is very grateful to her for her mercy, and asks if she has already seen Glenn's father, because it seems he doesn't have much time left, so let the young lady go and say hello before he passes away. The young lady understands that when they first married the Marquis, there were always guards outside his father's room who did not allow anyone to enter, but then everyone considered her a spy and was afraid that she might harm him, and now the main character agrees and says that she will do so. The woman says that this is great, and she is worried that she has taken up too much of the young lady's time, so she gets up from her seat and says that she'll probably go already. Then the main character asks her not to say that, because the girl was glad of her visit. After which, the young lady orders Adie to accompany the mistress. The maid obeys, and after that the young lady is left alone, she immediately looks with a cold gaze. A little time later, the girl, standing at the window, thinks about the words of that woman, but she said to visit the Marquis, and there must be a reason for this sudden attitude. The maid comes up to the mistress and asks if she would like some more tea. The main character refuses. And the maid apologizes to the mistress and asks if she is really going to visit the Marquis. Nadia says not now, but she needs to go. She claims that she had been planning to go for a long time, but there was no opportunity. The young lady thinks that she should take the chance and find out who is trying to harm him. The maid tells her mistress that she knows it is none of her business, but the young lady should be careful. The girl claims that she is talking about Lady Grace, and their relationship has changed so suddenly, so she is very worried. 
the maid excitedly says that she is in no way slandering her, and she knows how much the woman tries for the sake of the family. But the maid is just worried about Nadia. The main character smiles and says that she will be careful, and then thanks Risa for her concern. But after that, when the young lady looks out the window, she notices something strange. She sees her maid and Grace there, the two of them talking, and the young lady wonders why they are there. Risa says that Adie is a maid close to the lady, but the lady and Grace no longer run the house. Then she wonders why these two should be together. The main character thinks that this is somehow strange and is wary. That same day, she decides to visit the head of Winterfell. The girl comes there with the butler and looks at the lying man, and Gordon claims that this is Isaac Winterfell. Nadia will think that the man's face has fallen. The butlers approach the lying gentleman. He claims that the younger owner got married and asks Togo to look and see for himself how beautiful the new Marquise is. Gordon asks, didn't the gentleman say that he always dreamed of holding his grandchildren? He claims that the new Marquise is beautiful and smart, and the union of these two wonderful people will give many beautiful children. The butler holds his hand and asks him to open his eyes, and then turns to Nadia, and he tells her to bow to the venerable Marquis. The young lady thinks that Glenn must be there every time he comes, and every time she wonders how much it hurts him. The main character worships and greets Sir Isaac Winterfell. She claims that her name is Nadia, and she is the eldest daughter of the Duke of Balasith. She recently married and became a member of the Winterfell family. And even though she has little experience, she will do everything possible so as not to tarnish the reputation of Winterfell. Young lady is so sorry for tricking Gurin into marrying her, but nevertheless, her words are sincere. And she will really only leave when she makes Winterfell better. After that, they leave the room, and the butler locks it. The main character understands that the security of the room is very well monitored, and even the windows are locked. Now the young lady sees that everyone is attentive there, and no one can just get in and out. Therefore, the girl thinks that, as expected, one of her own is behind the death of the Marquis. But suddenly, Glenn approaches them from behind. He asks Nadia why she is there. The main character only replies that she was a little up, but wanted to visit the Marquis, because she is now a member of the Winterfell house. And then she turns to her husband and asks if they can now go to the Marquis together. When the young lady saw him in this state, it was clear that he was very lonely. The guy heard this and only agreed. Then Nadia says goodbye to the young man and says that they will see each other, and then wishes him to see his father well. But suddenly the main character remembers something else and turns around, addressing Glenn. And then she approaches the guy and asks if he will give her a minute after he checks on his father. A short time later, the main character is sitting in bed with a stack of papers. Risa says it's time to go to bed, madam. It's already midnight. The young lady asks if time has passed so quickly. Another maid only says that she heard that in other families, they don't stay that long, and their mistress works the most. Aidy says that the Marcus is also good and asks when he will already admit that he has the most hardworking and kind wife. The maid asks if the young lady thinks it would be better to use a love potion, after which she approaches the mistress and asks if she knows the legend of the thousand-year-old tree. The young lady says this is the first time she has heard of this. The maid adds that near the northern gate of the castle, there is a large tree growing, and it is thousand years old. They say it existed even before the castle was built. So the tree is magical and filled with spirits. She will answer in the spring only one day and only at night. There is a legend that if you pray to this tree for love, then you can make anyone fall in love with you. One of the maids screams that this is true, and the tree has united more than one couple in this way. Others say that maybe their mistress will make a wish as a joke, and they will check if it comes true. Then the young lady says that this is just a legend, and it turns out they just want to look at the tree. The maids say that they only heard that it is very beautiful and blooms only once. But if they go out at night, the terrible maid will scold them, so they ask the mistress to come with them. The young lady agrees and asks when it blooms, and the maids say in three days, and thank their mistress. The next morning, Risa is sleeping peacefully in her crib, but suddenly she is awakened by some sounds. It turns out to be Adie. The maid asks why her colleague is so early, and the girl replies that she just woke up early. The maid thinks this is a little strange, and wonders how long the girl sleeps. Risa asks if Adie is going somewhere and if she needs to get ready, and the blonde replies that she just thought that she should go to the dining room to be there first. But then a bag of gold coins suddenly falls out of her chest of drawers. Risa is shocked and asks if it is gold. And then he asks where Adie got so much money, but the blonde just turns around and says that she will go. Risa is a little worried about her friend's behavior. 
After that, she dresses and goes into the dining room, where the maids are already eating. The girl wonders if Aidy is there, but they agree to go to the dining room. Then the young lady approaches her colleague and says that she is responsible for the food today and then asks if Aidy has eaten yet, but the maid says that she has not seen her today. Then Risa asks Hazel if she saw Aidy in the dining room and claims that she is one of those close to the mistress, but the girl replies that she did not. Then the brown-haired woman thinks about when she could have disappeared in the morning, and she has a rather secretive behavior, and also where the money suddenly appeared from. So the young lady thinks that something is clearly going on lately. A short time later, the lady and three maids head towards that very tree. One of them says that today they are a cloud and they are lucky, because on such a day the flowers will definitely bloom. And another maid claims that she heard that the flowers of the thousand-year-old tree are very beautiful. Then Risa asks if they know that inside the tree, there is the spirit of the daughter of the goddess of love, so she decides all love affairs. She invites the lady to pray that everything will be fine with her, and the other maid says that if we all pray together, the wish will come true faster. The main character smiles and says that of course she is grateful, but aren't they too burdensome for the spirit? After which, Aidy points to the tree and tells the lady to look there because it is very beautiful. The young lady, looking in that direction, is surprised, and the maid asks if it is really beautiful. The main character just looks at the tree with pink petals, and Risa says that if the lady makes a wish, the Marquis will definitely change his mind. Nadia thinks that it is really beautiful, and it would be great if Glenn saw it too. But then the young lady doesn't understand why she suddenly thought about him. The maid says that the lady needs to close her eyes. After which, Risa turns to the spirit of the tree and asks Togo to make the Marquis fall in love with their mistress and let these two live happily ever after in Winterfell. The young lady thinks she is very grateful to her maid, but she and Glenn are not destined to be together, and someday she will have to leave Winterfell. But the girl folds her hands and wishes for Glenn to find his love. After all, someday on this earth Glenn will find happiness with a girl who will become the mistress of Winterfell. The young lady asks that one day he will definitely find someone who will truly love him, and maybe Glenn can make her happy. Hello? He may seem cold, but in fact he is a very kind person. The young lady clenches her fist and thinks why she has such strange feelings then. One of the maids turns to the Marquise and says that the lady's wish will definitely come true, because the Marquis of Winterfell and the lady are famous for their wonderful relationship, even though their marriage was of convenience, but the tree will probably give its blessing. Risa asks the lady if they can stay there a little longer, because she doesn't know when the next time she will have the opportunity to see this tree. Nadia with a smile tells her to look at her health, she thinks it's really fun to run away like that at night, after which the girl thinks that it has already become cool. One of the maids turns to her and asks if it's cold at night, because the lady is shaking. Nadia replies that it's just a little. Then Aidy tells the girls that she needs to bring the mistress back, and they should stay there for now. And if she sees them, then let them say that they were together, and she was the first to leave. Then the girls thank their colleague, after which the blonde leaves with the mistress. Risa thinks that in order to get there faster, it is better to go from the north than from the south. The girl thinks if there is a road that she doesn't know about. At this time, the main character is walking with Aidy. She says that in the north it is cold even at this time of year, although in the capital it is warm even at night. The blonde says that she didn't even notice and apparently got used to the northern weather. The girl's wife asks if she will ever be able to get used to it, and the maid replies that of course she will be able to see the girl there for a long time, so she will definitely get used to it. But suddenly, someone screams for them to stay where they are. It turns out that these are knights. The young lady asks who they are. The blonde claims that his name is Tristan and that he is the captain of the inner guard. He asks the lady to excuse him, but asks where she is going. The young lady claims that she is going to the room and then asks what happened, but Aunt suddenly comes out. She screams that this is a blatant lie and asks if the girl thought that she would not understand that she was trying to sneak out of the castle. The main character says that she doesn't understand what she's talking about and why there is running at such a time. But the woman just screams how embarrassed she is and whether the young lady thinks she can get away with it. After which, Grace unfolds the bundle of paper and says that this is a letter that the girl sent to Duke Balisith. The young lady then asks what is wrong with it, because if she read it, she could understand that it was an ordinary letter to her father. The woman only says that Nadia is an impudent girl and asks why she isn't ashamed, after which she orders one of the servants to give her a candle, and he brings a bundle of paper to the fire, after which a secret inscription appears on it that the girl has fulfilled her duty and will leave at noon.
The woman says that if you pour lemon juice on the inscription, it will completely disappear, but if you hold a sheet of paper to the fire, it will appear. So Grace asks if the girl thought she didn't know about it. The woman cries out that if she had hesitated a little, she would not have noticed, and then the girl had long since managed to go to her father. The young lady claims that she never wrote such a thing, and someone is clearly trying to set her up, because if she planned to return to the capital, then why did she get married? But Grace just turns around and turns to the doctor. She screams for him to explain. The man is a little scared, and the main character thinks that everyone, including Glenn and Giscard, has gathered there. The doctor will say that for some unknown reason the Marquis suddenly had a fever in the morning, and now his body is just boiling, and if this continues, his life is in danger. Everyone is shocked by this news. The main character asks if the woman wants to say that she tried to harm the Marquis, and Grace only claims that she herself knows about her sins, because after the girl came to Isaac to supposedly visit him, he felt bad. She screams that this must not be the first time the girl has done this, and this letter is proof of that. After which, the aunt tells Glenn to look at this shameless woman because she tried to harm his own father, so the girl should be immediately captured and interrogated. Glenn just frowns, and Giscard tells the lady first of all to calm down because she is seriously worried. The woman asks what it means to calm down. You ask if he calls you a friend of the Marquis, because how can she calm down when her family is harmed? Lord only says that this has not yet been proven. The woman asks what he is talking about, and she herself thinks why the guy is again on the side of that girl, because he is always ready to sacrifice himself for Isaac. Giscard says that it is worth starting with the fact that the lady has no reason to harm the Marquis, because Winterfell is headed by Glenn, and he personally would not want his daughter to see the benefit in taking the life of the Marquis. The woman just holds out the letter and asks the Lord what this letter is about then, and why the illness worsened after this girl visited her brother, and now she was trying to leave the palace at midnight, as written in the letter. The young lady claims that she just wanted to see the thousand-year-old tree bloom, and that's all. But the woman just turns around and asks if she will continue to make a fool of herself, because why then did she try to take a shortcut, and not through the northern gate, which immediately leads to her chambers? She screams to Glenn, isn't he confused by all this and the Duchess of Balasith, the woman who killed his mother, and now he's trying to kill his father? The guy just looks at her furiously, and the woman thinks that this facial expression is very scary. But what's more terrifying is that the person to whom he tried to give his heart was trying to destroy his family. Grace thinks that even if Giscard is on her side, the girl will not be able to go against Glenn. The guy just comes up to Nadia and says that he wants to hear her version. The girl agrees. She asks if the lady says that the letter indicates that she intends to harm the Marquis and go back to the capital. The woman says that everything is exactly like that, and the evidence is obvious, so the girls better not pretend. Well, the young ladies say that this is very strange, because she wrote this letter in front of Glenn. Grace is shocked by this, and the young lady turns to Glenn and says that he was there when she wrote this letter, and asks if he saw that she wrote something secret with fruit juice. Grace wonders what she's even talking about. She screams that this is complete nonsense, and the girl is only adding fuel to the fire. The young lady tells Glenn to answer, after which the guy claims that his wife is right, and she wrote this letter in his presence. Therefore, it turns out that someone forged the letter to slander his wife. The woman is shocked by this. She thinks why he was still listening quietly, and also why Aidy told me about Glenn. The guy just asks why his aunt did this, but she just screams in shock. What is he even talking about? And does Glenn really think that she is trying to frame the girl? She screams that this is someone's conspiracy, and she also doesn't know what's going on. But the guy just comes up to her and says that she herself forged the letter and somehow worsened his father's condition. And then she caused all this chaos in the middle of the night, and now she claims she's innocent. The guy claims that if he had accused his wife now, the truth would never have come out. He asks if this is what the woman wanted, and if Mrs. Grace is also to blame for the accident with the carriage. The woman just screams that this is all nonsense, and Isaac is her brother, and she would never harm her family. But the guy only claims that if the woman really cared so much about him, she would look for the real culprit. They tried to harm his father in order to blame Nadia, after which he orders the arrest of Mrs. Grace. She only desperately screams for Glenn to listen to her because she really is not to blame. The woman thinks how this happened and at what moment. She thinks that if this stupid maid had done her job properly, then everything would not have turned out like this. And since the guy is looking for the culprit, who else does she have a chance? Therefore, the woman points at Aidy and screams that this maid is to blame for everything, 
because she brought her that letter. Grace thinks that the girl was with her, and I cannot avoid the investigation, because when the interrogation begins, they will definitely believe her more, because she's a member of the family, and so she will be able to pin everything on the maid. But the main character only defends her maid. She says that her mistress was not enough and is now looking for a victim. The girl says she thinks she should say it. But come on, there are no sick brothers and sisters. The woman thinks what this means, and didn't the girl get a second job to pay for medicine for her sick brother, and since she has no reason, why risk herself and take such a step? She recalls how one servant claimed that he was carrying firewood at the request of his mistress, and then accidentally saw this maid. Grace wonders if the story about Jacob passing by and noticing the wayward maid is a complete lie. The woman realizes that this stupid girl planned everything. The young lady turned to the Marquis a short time ago. He asked if the Southerners were not to blame for the death of his mother, then who would be? The main character said that Glenn claimed that he also almost got into the carriage. The guy agrees. And the girl says that if this is the case, he too could have had an accident. And of course, this is still only an assumption. But if this happened, it would only benefit one person. Glenn realizes everything in shock. He says that it would be beneficial for the aunt, but how can this be, since she is a blood relative of the father? The main character says that she also hopes that it's not her, and this is just an assumption. Then the girl asks, why don't they check, because there is some way to prove it. After that, after consulting with Glenn, she chose the most suitable person in whom she had deep trust. Nadia told Adi that she played the main role in this matter, and the maid obeyed her mistress. The main character says that she actually doubted that the lady was to blame, but fortunately or not, she was caught. The young lady had no idea this would happen. Grace is now in complete shock, and Glenn approaches her and says that the lady will be presented in the court of Winterfell for charges of harming the Marquis. With a furious look, he tells her not to even dare count on protection, because she will definitely be kicked out of Winterfell. The woman does not believe in everything that is happening and just screams. Glenn then covers his face with his hand. The main character asks if he is okay. The guy claims that he did not want to believe until the last, because besides him and his aunt, his father had no one at all, and if not him, who else would take care of his father? The guy thinks how dare a woman kill his mother and live in his castle like a rat. Nadia is worried about Glenn. The same one says that he again owed her money. Well, the young lady just says that he shouldn't think about it like that, because it concerns her. A guy with a sad expression on his face calls his wife by name, but then Giscard approaches them. He claims that he will take upon himself the interrogation of the lady, and the Marquis need not worry, because they will thoroughly conduct the investigation so that no one can escape punishment. Glenn says he trusts him, and the Lord then thanks the lady for her help and asks if she needs to be escorted out. Marquis says it's a good idea, and then he extends his hand to his wife. The main character did not expect this, but she takes his hand and heads to her chambers. After they arrive at Nadia's room, the young lady thanks her husband for accompanying her, and then he claims that he will go. The girl understands that he may seem calm now, but inside, he is still grieving. The young lady is already turning around, but then the Marquis grabs her hand and pulls her into his arms. Nadia is shocked by this. She blushes a little and asks Glenn what happened, and he just continues to hug her. The guy thinks that today it became clear who was involved in the death of his mother, and although he should be sad, he is in perfect order. After all, it turned out that the girl is not the daughter of the enemy, and his heart is calm. The main character only moves Glenn away a little and asks if he is okay. The guy apologizes and then says he has something to tell Nadia. The guy thinks he can't help but admit it. But he can't imagine Winterfell without Nadia, so he wants to say something. But then he just looks away and says that they should talk about it now, and he will choose another day. But the girl must be tired, so let her rest. The young lady wishes him good night and enters the room, but left alone she wonders what it was. The next day, Glenn, sitting in his office, asks Giscarda whether the woman wanted to make her son a lord. The man replies that, and after long hours of interrogation, it turned out that she went to great lengths to ensure that her son became a lord. It seems that she has a lot of people in the city center, and she put a lot of effort into planning the accident. The Marquis says that Grace is so blinded by greed that she tried to kill her relatives. Then the Lord asks what they will do with her, and Glenn replies that the punishment should be proportionate to the crime, and all those involved should be executed and the Greenwood property confiscated. Giscard says that his master is right, and he only adds that, of course, before that they need to find out how the woman harmed her father. 
The guy asks if Grace admitted it. Lord say that you are just about to tell him. After which the man asks if the gentleman remembers the painting that hung in the Marquise's hospital room. Glenn asks if this is the painting that Grace gave and if something was found on it. Giscard says that everything is correct and giving a sick person a painting depicting the expulsion of an underground god was such a common occurrence that no one suspected anything. But after examining the painting, the man noticed that the paint on it was highlighted by the toxus plants. The young man begins to understand what is happening. He asks what kind of plant this is. And the Lord replies that when it blooms, it has a bright color that can be used as a dye. And when dried, toxic substances are released from the flower, which is why this plant is prohibited, but a similar color became lighter because the resulting dye was mixed with another paint. This plant does not have such a strong effect on healthy people. Glenn adds and says that sick people like his father can easily be killed. Giscard says that everything is true, and if it were not for the master, the Marquis would not have been saved. Then the guy asks what they say about his father's condition and whether he can still be cured. Lord claims that there is no exact answer, but his condition is now stable, and he thinks that for now he can only wait. Glenn says that when there are any changes, the Lord will definitely let him know. The main character is training with a bow at this time. She has clearly become better at it, because now she has hit the target. Fabian says that the mistress is simply wonderful, and he heard that she is a beginner, but she did a great job, and it seems that the master's training helped her. The young lady doesn't understand what he's talking about, but then she remembers those same training sessions and blushes a little. But then he immediately drives away such thoughts from himself. The knight asks if everything is fine with the young lady. The main character does not understand what he means. And Fabian claims that thanks to her, they found out who tried to harm the Marquis, and now there is nothing to worry about anymore. Therefore, the young man asks how she copes. The main character only asks the knights if they can finish earlier, believes she needs to come back now, and the guy agrees. After which the young lady leaves the training ground. She remembers the words of the Marquis and thinks about what he was trying to say then. This may sound funny, but what if he wanted to confess his feelings to her, although now they are in a different relationship? But the young lady wonders if she will be able to leave Winterfell then. At this time, someone reports that the team exploring the lair of the dragon Rio is returning. The main character says that they have finally returned, and lately the atmosphere has not been very good, so it's good that they came. The man with gray hair says that it's true, because there's a lot of stuff there. He claims that he has never seen so much gold and treasures, so he thinks that they should be sold slowly so that the price does not fall. The main character agrees and says that they will leave this matter to him. The man says that it seems that they found a lot of relics and documents. Therefore, if you put them up for auction, there will be buyers for them. Arthur says that thanks to them, Winterfell will be able to accumulate a good amount of money, no less than the Southerners. But suddenly, one of the knights screams for the master to look, and then runs towards him with an egg. Glenn is a little shocked by this. The knight says that this is the egg that he found, and Fabian asks if it is a dragon egg. And then he screams with enthusiasm that this is amazing and asks if a little dragon will hatch from it. The Marquis claims that perhaps there is no longer a living dragon there, because after the death of the owner, they forgot about him. The other knight says that he also thinks so, but nevertheless it was a pity to leave him there, so he asks what they should do. Glenn thinks a little, he doesn't understand what to do with this egg because he can't break the shell to check if the baby is alive. And you can't just take and sell a valuable item, which apparently is a dragon egg. But then an idea comes to him. Therefore, the guy turns to the main character. He asks if he can trust her with this egg because the girl found Rio, so it's on her. The young lady asks if this is true and if I can trust her with such a valuable thing. The Marquis says that, of course, the likelihood that it will hatch is extremely small, given how much time has passed since the death of the dragon, but it will be a unique decoration. The young lady accepts the egg and thanks her husband. After this, the dragon egg is placed in the office, and the maids immediately look at him with interest. One of them claims that she would never have thought that she would see something like this in real life, and Risa says that if the baby really hatches, then they will have to raise a little dragon. The blonde says how cute he will be, and another maid asks if it will be possible to tame him because then the mistress will become a dragon rider or a tamer. The main character approaches them and says that they shouldn't wait for this, because a lot of time has passed since the death of the adult dragon, and even if it was a real dragon egg, he would not have lived to this day. One of the maids says that again the lady still hopes for hatching, because they see that the young lady would also like it. 
The main character just smiles. She thinks that this is the first gift that Glenn gave her, so she will take care of it. Suddenly, Gordon knocks on the door. The Marquis turns around and asks what happened, and the butler says that a message has just arrived from the capital. He claims that Lord Li Ji Ho killed the poisonous dragon Gadabiru in the south of the country. Glenn asks what he's talking about. The main character understands that Gordon seems to be talking about what happened in the past. Although Li Ji Ho gained some fame thanks to his expedition to Kalai, real fame came to him only after he defeated the poisonous dragon Gadabiru. In addition, he became a hero in the war against demons, but the main character wonders what will happen in the future. The butler adds that the capital is now buzzing with news, because if in the north there is a war hero, the Marquis, that in the south is the dragon hunter, Lord Li Ji Ho and Gordon, fears that this will lead to increased influence of the south. The Marquis claims that no matter what they do, they will do what they owe to each their own. At this time, Duke Balazit enters the hall. He asks if this young man is behind the death of Gadabiru. The blonde claims that he is honored that the dragon slayer himself came to them. Li Ji Ho tells him to stop joking like that, because the duke is flattering him, but the father of the main character not only says welcome back, after which the guy bows down and says that 27 ray wagers are returning to the duke. The blonde says the guy did a great job. He thinks that the dragon found in Valen Castle has become a weak point for the guy, but now that he has earned the honorary title of Dragon Hunter, the duke knows that he will not fall without a fight. After which the duke says that Li Ji Ho is just in time and he has someone to introduce the guy to. After which he calls Aiden to him and claims that this is his nephew. He graduated from the academy this year and returned to the capital. Aiden says that he is very pleased to meet you and then claims that the fame of Lord Ji Ho has reached distant academies. The brunette says that his name is Li Ji Ho. He claims that he is not that great and is simply enjoying the protection of the duke. Li Ji Ho think that this nephew, who according to Duke Balazit, having only a daughter, will inherit the title. The guy understands that if he is the next duke, then it would be worth finding a common language with him. The nephew says that the guy looks exactly as they say about him, and it is not surprising that the duke was thinking about marrying him with Nadia's cousin. The lord just smiles tightly and thanks him for such words. Then the duke comes up to them and says that enough chatting already, because he should have gone already. Bloggers claim they've prepared the best booze in the South to treat him to, after which he approaches the Lord and says that, of course, they will reward him not only with drinks. He asks if the guy has anything he would like to ask. After all, today they are celebrating his achievements, so here he can ask for whatever he wants. He can also petition the king to be knighted. The heart says that such an opportunity does not come often, and he will give him time to think about it because the night will still be long after which he leaves and tells Aiden to join. The brunette just remains alone. He thinks that he has already been deprived of what he wants. At this time, the main character sits and watches the dragon egg. She thinks that the color of the egg has somehow changed, and maybe it depends on her mood. At this moment, the Marquis enters the room. The young lady asks if he came, and the guy claims that he didn't want to interfere, but the girl replies that everything is fine. Nadia recalls the events of that day, and thinks that things between them are somehow awkward, because this is the first time they were alone after that day. The guy claims that last time he wanted to say something and is trying to say it now, but then screams are heard. After he opens the door, he asks what happened, and the maid, breathing heavily, reports that the eldest gentleman has woken up. After that, they all go to Glenn's father. The eldest gentleman asks if his son managed to marry Balazit's daughter while he was unconscious. The father asks if Glenn is saying that she foresaw the Black Doom bought and sold medicine, developed a plan to take over Balong Castle, found the location of the Dragon Rio, created new forms of armor, developed new farming methods, and uncovered Grace's plot. The guy claims that everything is true. Then the elder gentleman asks if the guy is saying that the young lady did all this because of her love for him. Glenn says yes, and his father claims that no matter how quickly the situation changes, it still cannot change their financial situation. Gordon says that it was love at first sight, and the gentleman is really very handsome. His father claims that he looks like his mother, but there is no need to dwell on it. Glenn sighs and says that in general, he wanted to say that Nadia is not a Balasite spy, and she is an ally of Winterfell, so there is no need to fear her. Isaac only asks if Glenn warns him in advance not to communicate badly with her, but the guy claims that this is not entirely true, after which he silently looks at his wife. The young man thinks that his father is partly right, but he did not want to hurt Nadia's feelings, 
so he continued to justify. The elder gentleman just laughs. He says that if the girl was a spy, Glenn would quickly figure her out. Isaac says that before his son was a bore, but now he has suddenly become a caring husband, and it is true what they say that children are born upside down. The man says he thinks his son is very enthusiastic. The main character agrees, and a little embarrassed, tells her father that the guy is always there. The man smiles, and the butler tells the Marquis that they thought he would be interested to know how finances have changed in Winterfell over the years, so they have prepared an appropriate book for this. Gordon asks if the gentleman will look at her, and the man replies that he just wanted to know about this and the butler is a good fellow. Isaac flips through the book and thinks that no matter how much Glenn says that finances are in order, this is not enough to calm him down, because there have been expeditions on this barren land, and rather unsuccessful ones. But then the man looks at the book in shock, after which he turns to the butler and asks if this is true about their finances. He claims that there seems to be something wrong there, because even though the new mistress has done a lot, there is something too much there. Gordon says that he understands that this is hard to believe, because he also managed it with difficulty, but now their Winterfell in wealth can only compete with the South. The elder gentleman is shocked by this. He turns to the young lady and thanks her, because the girl did a good job. Isaac says he was always worried about finances, but now he is calm. The main character asks what her father is talking about, because this is not only her merit, because they all did it together. And of course, everything worked out because Glenn trusted her. Father says that they cope with everything so well, and now there is no need to be afraid of dying. All that remains is to wait for the heir. The main character, a little puzzled, asks what he is talking about. And the man says that of course, by law, their family must have a successor, and they both look healthy, so he doesn't think it's worth worrying about. Then an awkward silence hangs. The first one to interrupt it is the father. Isaac asks if he is wrong and then he wonders why they are silent. The main character wants to tell him something, but then thinks that it is better for her to remain silent. After all, no matter how close the girl is to Glenn, in the end it will be she who will leave Winterfell, and, if subsequently, there is a woman whom he truly loves. But then the young lady turns to her father, and then says that the Marquis said that he did not intend to approach her. Isaac is shocked, and Glenn looks at his wife in shock. He remembers how he told her that he would never see a loved one in Balazit's daughter. The guy curses this, and thinks that even though this situation was a misunderstanding, it cannot be denied that he offended Nadia. But the guy thinks that he apologized. Then the father turns to Glenn and asks what the girl is talking about and whether he really told her that. The main character tells her father that it's not Glenn's fault, because it was she who fell in love with the Marquis and forced him to marry her, and you can't force a person to love someone he can't. However, the girl thinks that it is obvious that the Marquis would like to see an heir, because this is the most important thing in a noble family. There is only one way not to lead to a divorce and keep the family name intact. Then the main character asks how about the Marquis taking a concubine, but the guy is clearly not happy with such a proposal. The father asks why Glenn needs another woman if he has one, because the girl herself will not want to raise someone else's heir. The main character says that, unfortunately, if the Marquis wants this, she will not resist. Isaac tells the young lady that he's had enough, and asks Gordon to come out too, because he thinks he should talk to Glenn. After they are alone, the father asks how this happened, and why there was such a conversation at all, because it is clear that the girl is dear to him, and as soon as the father opened his eyes, Glenn hugged her. The guy replies that he couldn't do anything. At first he thought that Nadia was a spy sent by Balazit, and didn't think that she would take his words so to heart. Isaac asks if his son has now changed his mind. The Marquis answers yes, and then the elder gentleman tells him to go and correct this misunderstanding, and also apologize for all the offenses he caused. The father claims that he sees that the girl is a very good person. Then the guy agrees with his father and says that he will do so. The young lady is already lying in her bed at this time. She thinks that sleep does not come at all and wonders what she should do. The girl remembers her words to the concubine, and she understands that on other days she would have gotten away with it. But now everything is different, and now Glenn trusts her completely, and if he really confesses his feelings to her and wants to be with her, the young lady would not be able to refuse. And besides, the older gentleman asked why Glenn needed another woman if there was Nadia. After all, she herself will not want to raise someone else's heir. The main character imagines Glenn and a child from another woman. The young lady understands that she doesn't even want to imagine this, but she realizes that if she gets stuck in this, all her plans will go to waste. 
Nadia understands that she must not forget the past, and if she remains in the house of Winterfell, then like me she will be drawn into politics. But the girl understands that she must not forget what her ultimate goal is. Suddenly, someone knocks on the door. It turns out to be the Marquis. He asks if he can come in. The main character immediately gets out of bed and says that of course it's possible. After which, the young man enters the room. He says that he would like to apologize, because all his words about the girl being a spy for the Duke of Balisith were the result of his own rash judgment. Therefore, the young man asks to forgive him. The main character remembers her relatives. She understands that she was wrongly accused or insulted more than once. But no one ever apologized, and the guy is completely different. Therefore, the main character says that everything is fine, and the guy just approaches her and says what he said last time. After which he approaches the young lady and puts his hand on her cheek. The main character closes her eyes from this. The young man leans towards her, and their lips almost touch in kisses. But then the main character pushes him away and tells him to wait. The guy is a little shocked by this, and the young lady thinks that she promised, and it's impossible. So Nadia decides that she must admit that she only married the guy to escape her father's clutches. The young man asks if everything is okay, but the main character only looks at him seriously. She claims that she also has something to say. Nadia understands that if the guy gets angry and says that he will get a divorce now, then nothing can be done. The young lady needs to admit that the girl married him by deception and end it. Glenn asks what she wants to say. The main character thinks that if she explains how desperate she was, will he be able to understand her? Then the young lady asks if Glenn will listen to her, and after that, the two of them go out into the garden. The guy claims that a lot of things have bloomed there. The young lady agrees with him and says that it's already summer in the north, so it's getting warmer. The Marquis looks at his wife and wonders if he was in a hurry, because I must admit, he also doesn't know how to kiss. But then he turns around, a little embarrassed. The main character says that it seems they just got married recently, but several months have already passed. The guy says that if you think about it, this is their first walk after the wedding, and he himself thinks that he was too indifferent with his wife because the girl went all the way to the north to find him. And now, when he tried to kiss her, Nadia pushed him away. Now the guy is thinking how pathetic he is, and the main character turns to him. The girl asks if Glenn trusts her. He claims that there was a misunderstanding before, but now he certainly trusts her. The guy thinks why these are such questions. And the young lady sadly says that she actually needs to confess something and asks if Glenn can. You listen to her, promising not to get angry. The guy is a little shocked at first, but then he gets down on his knee and says that he swears so that the girl doesn't say anything. He promises to believe her. The main character remembers all the moments spent together. She thinks that if she tells the truth, then Glenn will be disappointed in her. Although the young lady's feelings were not sincere, she really enjoyed spending time with him. Nadia thinks she has such a strange feeling and wonders why her heart is beating so much. But then tears begin to flow from her eyes, and the girl does not understand what it is. The Marquis approaches her. He wipes her tears and says that the girl wants to say that she did not marry him for love. The young lady only thinks how he found out, and the guy now understands what's going on. He says that he doesn't doubt her loyalty to Winterfell after what she did. The Marquis says that thanks to the girl, Winterfell is only blossoming, and so is he. The guy claims that a lot has changed, but the more often he thinks about it, the more difficult it is for him to believe that such a wise woman could fall in love with him, a stranger to her. But even if it was all a lie, Nadia is very important to him now. So the guy asks what truth she wants to tell. Then the young lady says that she really hates her family and tells the whole story. The Marquis, in shock, asks if the Duke and her sister tried to kill Nadia. The main character says that he does, and he wanted to use her as a pawn and then get rid of her. And if she had stayed with her father, he would definitely have finished her off. And in order to save herself, she had to flee from Balazit. That's when the young lady met the Marquis. Someone who hates Balazith as much as she does. A person with a status of power capable of resisting Duke Balazith and the one who will avenge her. The main character says that because of Togo, she had to lie and she is sorry. Nadia says that if she continues to help develop Winterfell in order to resist Balisith, then this will benefit the guy. And one day, when the Balisith family falls, she will quietly leave Winterfell. The Marquis is shocked by this. He asks what it means that she will leave, and the young lady says that she will definitely file for divorce. After all, a guy also doesn't want to stay with an unloved woman. Nadia apologizes and says it's all her fault. Therefore, she offers to get a divorce when everything is resolved and the guy finds a new wife. 
The young man suspected that his wife had secrets, but he didn't even think that everything was so serious, and now he understands what happened. The Marcus was so focused on his property that he didn't care about her. The girl found the best means to achieve the goal and built a sequence of her plans, after which she did not object to being called a woman blinded by love, but at the same time she desperately thirsted for revenge. The main character asks if he is very angry. The guy thinks that if he thinks about it, there's nothing to be angry about. And the girl's hatred for Duke Balazit is nothing less than good luck for him. After all, the young lady revived Winterfell in an unimaginable way, and the guy will never meet such a wise and capable person as Nadia again. The young lady will take revenge, and the guy, in turn, will get rid of his sworn enemy, Balazit. But is this the very rational approach when you get what you want? The young man thinks that this is certainly true, but for some reason, the guy thinks that his heart is cold. The main character just looks at him and asks if this surprised him and if the Marquis is disappointed, but he replies that everything is not like that at all, and he himself is trying to think rationally because he was simply embarrassed that the girl kept saying that she was in love with him, but what if she had not helped Winterfell? But now the young lady is probably faced with even more difficult tasks than before, so she should put aside her emotions and think only about the interests of her part of her family. Glenn sighs heavily and says that you are definitely disappointed, but to think that there is nothing to be angry about. After all, Winterfell prospers only thanks to Nadia, and he wants to destroy the Balasite house one way or another, and the girl had no other choice, so he won't blame her for lying about her feelings for him. The young lady says she didn't think he could understand her and thanks Glenn. The guy says that now we can say that they have a profitable partnership and there is no longer any need to lie that she loves him. Then the main character smiles and says yes, but she herself thinks that like the guy said, they now have a profitable partnership, so she shouldn't worry for nothing. But that same evening, the Marquis is practicing archery. The guy thinks, since when has he been unable to take his eyes off a girl, even when she just smiles? He was surprised to hear that he was supposed to have an heir from another woman. Now he puts his hand on his head, but immediately a knight runs up to him and screams that the gentleman has red liquid. The guy looks at his hands and realizes that he pulled the corners too hard. And then he turns around and says that everything is fine, so the knight shouldn't worry. The Marquis thinks that he was going to tell the girl to stay with him. He remembers the young lady talking about the divorce and how it was all her fault. Fabian is worried about his master, and the young man just puts his hand on his head and says that now everything is clear. After all, it is not Nadia who is in love with him, but he with her. The knight realizes that the gentleman is behaving strangely and wonders if something happened to his lady. But Risa also says that the lady has no appetite or energy lately. But suddenly one of the maids runs up to the Marquis, after which she says that the Marquis told him to come to his mistress's chambers. The guy is a little shocked by this, but agrees. The main character is sitting on her bed. She remembers the maid saying that the master will be there tonight, and the Marquis insists that they have an heir. Suddenly, someone knocks on the door and says he is coming. It turns out to be Glenn. The main character asks if the Marquis sent him, and then tells him not to worry because she understands. The girl turns around and tells the guy to sleep on her bed, and she will lie on the sofa. But the Marquis grabs her hand and then claims that they are out of necessity, and he will sleep on the sofa. The young lady says she can't afford that, and then asks if they can share the same bed. The girl says that the bed seems to be big and thinks that they will be comfortable, but the boy is a little embarrassed by this. After which the two of them lie down on the bed, but a little far from each other. The Marquis is a little shy. He thinks how he can calm down, because the girl has nothing against it and he shouldn't be selfish. After which he turns to the main character and says that it must be hard for her. The young lady just remains silent with a sad expression on her face. Then the guy looks at her and thinks that he should say something. The young man thinks what an idiot he is, but Nadia says that everything is fine now because she is there and Winterfell is the most inaccessible place for her father, especially if something happens. Then Glenn will help her. Then the guy immediately jumps out of bed, and then he claims that he will definitely protect her. The young lady wonders what this means, and the guy claims that in any case, they are partners with her, having a common goal, and as long as they are together, nothing should harm her, so the guy will protect her. The main character understands what she said, that she doesn't love him, and it's all a pretense, and the guy says that he will protect her. But even blood relatives and people she trusted turned their backs and betrayed her. Nadia thinks why is he saying this. And the guy at this time approaches the main character and hangs over her. He thinks that if the girl doesn't mind, then will it be greedy to ask her to stay. But at the same moment, a pillow blocks his path. 
The girl embarrassedly asks if he minds if she just sits like this. The young lady thinks that one should not take advantage of such a good person and be around him. After all, the guy will definitely meet a worthy girl, more worthy than her. The main character asks Glenn to forgive her, because if the girl's plan succeeds, then she wants to leave Winterfell, and in her thoughts Nadia adds that this is for his sake. The guy is a little shocked by this, and then he smiles sadly. He says that he understands and heard the young lady, and then he takes her hand with his. And kissing her, he claims that no matter what happens, he will try to help her. The next day, the maid goes for a walk with the mistress. The main character says that there is warm weather in the north, and asks maybe in such weather the flowers will all bloom. But when the girl turns around, she doesn't see her maids, but only hears their cries about something cute. When the young lady turns around, she sees the marquee there. The maids say that the master looks so brave. They say that it's hot outside, and why is he dressed so warmly? The main character sighs. Now she understands why the maids wanted to take a walk so much, but the girls tell their mistress that their marquee is beautiful. Risa asks if she knows that his lordship won the annual fencing tournament with the best swordsman of the empire, and he even won the imperial archery tournament, so there is no other knight like him in the entire continent. Nadia thinks how cool this is, and this completely explains the possibility of love at first sight. She thanks the guy for being so good. One of the maids says that she heard that Mr. Lee Ji Ho has been very popular in the South lately, but he still cannot surpass their marquee, because Mr. Ji Ho only wields a sword, and their master is a master of the sword and bow. Risa says that this is not all, and he is known for his ingenuity on the battlefield, and he is also taller. But then the young man comes up behind them and agrees. They say that he is indeed taller. The maids are very scared by this. And the guy, smiling, also adds that his shoulders are wider. The main character laughs and asks what he is talking about. But the young man just looks at her and remembers how the girl said that she wanted to leave Winterfell. He thinks that he said that he heard Nadia, but he didn't say that he would follow her words. The guy regrets everything he said to her, and it drives him crazy because he was fed up with her after her family betrayed her. Now he turns to the main character and says that if she has time, would she like to continue her archery training? He thinks that he is not going to let the young lady go, or even if he does not have the opportunity to turn back time, he will create a new opportunity to convince Nadia, after which they go on horseback to the forest. The young lady is a little surprised and asks her husband why they are there. The girl thought he wanted to go archery and didn't understand why they were there. But the guy says the fastest way to improve your skills is to practice. The main character says in shock that she can barely draw the bow and is not even sure that she will hit the target. But the young man tells her not to worry because he will closely monitor everything. The main character then asks where all the other knights are. It seems strange to her, because they came to such a remote place, so they need protection. The Marquis, blushing a little, replies that the other knights had not yet finished their training, so he did not take them, but he understands that this was a lie. After all, a few hours ago, one of the knights asked if the gentleman wanted to know how to change the mistress's opinion, and the other cried out whether this really meant that Nadia's feelings for him had cooled. But this was expected so they repeatedly told the gentleman that he needed to stop avoiding her feelings. The guy angrily replies that that's not the point. He thinks that he cannot tell them Nadia's secret, so all he can do is remain silent. The ward with red hair screams so that the master does not worry and trusts them, because they are the guys of the North who always keep their word. The knight with green hair says that the guys from the South know nothing and call the Northerners incompetent in love, but they are very mistaken, and your knight says that lately, the average aristocrat has been popular with such unreliable men as the northerners. They are already starting something like a lecture. The ward with red hair tells the master that now the knight of Winterfell will give a special lesson for him. And to begin with, the marquis should invite his wife to practice archery in the forest without their presence. So now the guy is talking to his wife and saying that if something happens, he will protect her, so the girls don't have to worry about security. After which the young man offers to start training for real combat, this was the second step in the knight's plan, namely to appear cool to the young lady, after which Glenn pulls the bowstring and says that there is game wandering nearby. The main character is a little shocked by this, she thinks why so suddenly, and at this time he crawls out of the bushes. This monster was sent in advance by the knights, and the Marcus finished him off with one blow. The young lady approaches Glenn and says that she heard that the guy is the most outstanding shooter in the entire empire, but this is really amazing. 
The Marquis just clears his throat in embarrassment and asks if she would like to try stringing the bow. The main character says whatever she wants, but she must have left her bow on the horse. Then the young man hands her a bow from his hands. He claims that he made it specifically for Nadia, and he himself understands that this was the third step in the knight's plan, namely to prepare a special gift. Nadia thanks her husband and asks when he had time, and she understands that he is somehow strange today. The main character looks at him, but from behind she hears some noise behind the stone, and when she looks a little closer, she sees a piece of red hair there. Now the young lady begins to understand what is happening. She assumes that the fact that they were left alone there and the game suddenly appeared was planned with the help of the knights. Those two are sitting behind the stones, and one of them says that it seems my lady liked the gift, and everything is going according to plan. The girl remembers the gossip that northerners are inept in love relationships, but this situation is so sweet. Then the Marquis points to one of the trees and invites the young lady to try to shoot at his center. The brown-haired lady agrees and pulls back the bowstring, then releases the arrow. But she falls before reaching the tree. The Marquis says that she has become much better. This was the fourth step of the knight's plan, in which Glenn had to certainly praise Nadia. But then he looks at his wife and realizes that something is wrong, because she bowed her head. But the main character does not hold back and laughs. The guy asks why his wife is laughing. The young lady says that she just wants to, and you think that at first the girl thought he was a really cold and intimidating person, but it turned out that he was simply inexperienced in such things. After which, Nadia turns to her husband and says that he is very affectionate. The guy is a little embarrassed by these words, but a little later it starts to rain. The young lady looks up at the sky and asks Glenn if even the weather was part of his plans. The guy asks what she is talking about, and then he turns to Nadia and wonders a little embarrassedly whether she really guessed everything, after which he covers her with his cloak and says that there is an abandoned hut nearby, so they can stay there for a while until the rain subsides. The young lady agrees, and they head to that same hut in the middle of the forest. The Marquis says that it doesn't seem like the rain will stop that easily, but they might still have to spend a reasonable amount of time there. But after the young master looks at his wife, his face immediately turns red. After all, the young lady is completely wet from the rain. Glenn covers her with his cloak and asks if the girl is cold. The main character, in response to such actions, is a little embarrassed and thanks her husband. After which, the young lady looks out the window and says that it would be better if it snowed. The Marquis doesn't understand why she suddenly wanted snow, but then he says that if you think about it, in the South, there is almost no snow even in winter. The young lady replies that this is true, and her childhood dream was to make a huge snowman, but it did not come true because there was not enough snow. The Marquis says that in the North in winter, the snow piles up to the chest, but he also did not make a snowman. The young man says that if the opportunity arises in the future, we should sculpt it together and make it huge. The girl thinks that the other day she had a lot of different jobs, but now she's having a good time listening to the sounds of rain, and it seems that her soul is becoming calmer. The Marquis says that his wife can lie down when she is tired. The young lady with a smile on her face thinks that the guy will not calm down, and then she puts her head on his shoulder. Glenn is a little embarrassed by this. A little time later, two knights are wandering through the forest. One of them says that he did not expect that the rain would start so suddenly, and because of it, they miss the master. But then they see a hut in the middle of the forest and decide to look further there, but after they go there. They see their master sleeping peacefully with his mistress, so the knights decide not to disturb them. A short time later, the main character is sitting with her husband at the table. Butler says that there is an intensive introduction of new agricultural tools, and when inspecting the lands, one could notice the first initial reaction of the feudal lords to the innovation. The Marquis claims that it was also said that the peasants who migrated to the new lands are adapting well there, and this is all thanks to Nadia. The young lady says that she is grateful to the Marquis for such words, but she certainly was not alone in all this. The main character thinks that lately everything has been like a dream, and her plans are quietly becoming reality. If we compare her current life with her past, now everything is very peaceful and warm. Nadia wants time to stop at this moment, although she knows that such a desire is very selfish. But then the two lock eyes, and Glenn then looks away in embarrassment. The main character just laughs in response to this, but suddenly the maid runs into the room and screams that she has an emergency message. And then he says that the monsters are attacking. The most important people in the Winterfell family gather around the round table. One of them claims that a couple of people were injured in a village located along the northern demarcation line. 
and the damage was reportedly not very significant. Another man says that, however, it will not be long before the packs of monsters reach densely populated villages. Glenn asks whether there is anything else worth discussing, and whether it is worth immediately starting to prepare for the expedition. The wards say that immediately after preparation, they will hit the road. Nadia asks her husband what about testing out a new weapon, and on this trip they can test it in real combat. Giscard agrees with the lady's point of view, and says that besides, near the Yerez mountain range, which is the goal of the expedition, no one will see it, and they will be able to keep this weapon a secret. The Marco agrees, and then says that they will do so. He says that first he needs to clarify the nature of the area, but the young lady says that she has something else to say, and then asks if she can join the expedition. The guy is a little shocked by this question. One of the men sitting at the table says that so far, the girls have not participated in the campaign against monsters, and it is too dangerous. The young lady understands that they are opposing it more actively than expected, but she certainly must be on this expedition to successfully complete that matter. But then the Marquis only asks if there are reasons for refusal, and then looks at his wife. And she says that this is none other than Nadia. If we remember the exploits that she accomplished, then the girl most of all has the right to participate in this expedition. Glenn claims that there will be no danger because he will protect his wife, after which they head to the battlefield with monsters. There are often incidents where monsters living in the land of demons invade the human world through the gate. Since the cause is unknown and the invasion cannot be prevented, it is a disaster that must be responded to as quickly as possible. Glenn orders the attack to begin and to maintain distance. After this, the archers begin to shoot at the monsters. The guy sitting on his horse says that, as expected, ordinary arrows do not work for them, and another knight asks if he can give an order to retreat. But the Marquis tells him to wait a little, and then when he sees that the monsters are close enough, then he shouts to the knights to retreat. Another knight tells the master that everything is as he said. The monsters are chasing the horse archers who were bait, and their formation is completely disorganized. The Marquis says that the monsters are just a herd of stupid people with large physiques, and it's not difficult to defeat them if you use your brains. After which, the guy takes the sword out of its sheath and says that he will try to hunt the mice driven into the corner and orders the knights to attack. He plunges the monsters into eternal sleep one by one, and the main character watches all this from a cliff. After which, the Winterfell knights win. The young lady says that if so many monsters descended on their land, they would cause so much damage. The knight tells the lady not to worry, because they have a master in them, and this time they won a victory without a single casualty. He also says that the presence of such a gentleman in the north as theirs is simply a joy to the soul. The main character agrees with Fabian. She says that Glenn is really encouraging. The girl thinks that after the wedding, she often heard about Glenn's exploits from the warriors, but seeing everything with her own eyes is even more amazing. The girl thinks that Glenn has fulfilled his role, and now it is her turn. The young lady tells the Marquis that she has a conversation with him. The guy asks what it is, and Nadia is told that with the help of the leftovers from the monsters, she wants to create a unique product that will be produced only in their area. The guy is a little shocked by this, and the other knights tell the lady that they tried to benefit from this huge amount of leftovers every time they fought with monsters. However, in reality they are useless, and it is best to burn everything before it causes too much trouble. The young lady just smiles and asks what if she knows how to take advantage of them. The two men are a little shocked, and the Marquis asks if Nadia could tell me how. He understands that the girl clearly has some kind of plan, since she has always helped Winterfell with her ingenuity. The main character says that the remains from monsters can be used as excellent medicinal material. Glenn says that earlier they asked their healer, but he said that you monsters have nothing useful. The young lady claims that this is because the manufacturing method is unknown to the world, and she accidentally read about it in her childhood in an ancient forbidden book. The guy asks if she wants to say again that the information she accidentally learned could be useful. Yes, the main character agrees. The girl understands that their doubts are expected. She also knows all this from a past life. More precisely, you are in a war with demons that will begin in the future. In it, it was noticed and found out that demons use parts of their own kind as medicine. The main character says that the volume of agricultural production is important, but for the continued prosperity of their territory, it is necessary to develop other industries, so trade must be revived. It is for this reason that turning the remains of monsters into a special product is a very important mission for Winterfell. The guy says that his wife is right, and if they manage to create this special product, 
then it will become their reliable resource. The main character says that she will give an example and points to Meduso as a similar monster. The girl claims that even though he has no legs, he will still be of sufficient use. The young lady says that from the byproducts of the jellyfish, they can use the snake venom that is in her hair, and in fact, there is barely a noticeable difference between the medicine and the poison so they can use it. But the main character does not have time to finish when a snake attacks her. The girl is very scared of this. However, the Marquis immediately pulls her towards him and beheads the snake. Then he asks if his wife is okay. The girl, a little scared, says she's fine, and then asks how Glenn is. The guy just hugs her and says that it makes her happy, and such a relief, the new one suddenly feels a sharp pain. And looking at his hand, he sees the melted armor and is surprised. That same evening, the young lady approaches the knights. One of them says that it is all their fault, because before escorting the young lady, it was necessary to carefully check whether the monsters had died. The main character tells the knights not to blame themselves because it was she who made the mistake of recklessly going there. At this time, another man comes out of the tent and says that the area of injury is extensive, but he does not think that the gentleman was poisoned, and this is great happiness. But at night, his temperature may rise, so he needs to call a nurse and apply a cold compress. Nadia says that there is no need for a nurse, because she will personally stay with him, after which the girl enters the room with the duke. The guy asks if she was hurt. The main character says that she was a little scared, but everything is fine. But she claims that what is more important now is that Glenn suffered because of her. The Marquis says that snake monsters are tenacious, and even after the death of their bodies, they can remain alive, and it is their fault that they did not check it thoroughly. But it is not the girl's fault, so she should not torment herself. The main character says that even without protective clothing, he rushed to protect her. The girl argues that the Marquis needs to value his body a little more, since he is the head of the Winterfell family. The girl understands that he saved her despite the danger, and maybe in his eyes, the young lady looks like she's grumbling, but she's just afraid for him. The young master claims that he is much more skilled than them in fighting magical beasts, and he also made promises to his wife. The young lady, realizing that he also has a knighthood, and maybe this is the mindset of knights. The girl was closely acquainted with a couple of knights. Fabian had a little brother vibe. Lee Ji Ho was a piece of trash who left his fiancé for his career. Therefore, the girl understands that she did not notice their nightly thinking. Afterwards, she turns to her husband and says that she wants to say something. When the young gentleman agrees, the girl says that he just sounded cool. And if she had been a little more frivolous, she might have fallen in love with him. The guy's face immediately turns red from this, but then the main character says that, of course, she doesn't mean that she really fell in love with him, so he can be calm. After which the girl asks what happened to the Marquis's face, and he just turns around and wonders whether the girl realizes what she just said. But the main character only says that it was not her imagination. She reaches her hand to his forehead, and he says that she was told that he might develop a fever because of the poison, and asks if this is the reason. But then the young lady pulls back and says the guy's forehead is on fire, after which she puts him back on the bed, and he says that today he better go to bed early, and he can trust her with caring for the patient. The Marquis thinks that after she said such a thing, how can he calmly fall asleep right in front of her? But a little later he falls asleep. Nadia places her hand on his forehead. The girl says that she was worried, but fortunately, the fever subsided greatly. She remembers how Glenn recently said that it would not be dangerous because he would protect her. The lady with brown hair thanks her husband for keeping his promise, and then kisses him tenderly on the cheek. A short time after eliminating the monsters, the Winterfell punitive squad immediately returned, taking back with them the remnants of the monsters. Now the Marquis extends his hand to help the young lady get off the map. The main character takes his hand, and when he comes out, he's surprised because it's already snowing there. The young master says that it is slowly starting to get colder. The girl realizes that so much time has passed since her arrival in Winterfell. The Marcus says that, by the way. Didn't she say that she wanted to build a snowman? Then he approaches her and says that he thinks they will soon be able to do this. The main character says that this is really so. One of the wards grins and says that these two now look like real spouses, and the other says that their method of winning the mistress's heart worked. After which the main characters are met by the butler, he greets them. The Marquis says that Gordon did a good job and asks if anything happened in their absence. The butler says that nothing special happened, and in his thoughts adds that this is except for the fact that his work was doubled due to the absence of his mistress. He then says that Wayne, who left the capital, returned to their lands and said that he wanted to see his lady. 
the main character says that then perhaps she will arrange their meeting. The girl thinks that he is on time, and she just has a request for him. After which one man claims that most of the jewelry and works of art were sold through auctions, and the total amount was 84,000 gold coins without taking into account the fees for the auction room, and they can look at the details in the accounting books and documents. The Marquis says that he did a good job, and most likely it was hard to travel first to the capital and then return back. The man answers that there is nothing of the kind, and that is his job, because it is also beneficial for him when the brokerage commission is higher than usual. Then the young lady turns to Wayne and asks if he could go to the capital again. The man asks what she is talking about and whether the girl has discovered another rare dragon. The young lady claims that this is not the case, and after the last attack of the monsters, they collected what was left of them, so she plans to create a special product from them and sell it, but several materials are needed for this work process. Wayne asks what she's talking about and if she's going to sell the leftovers from the monsters, since it's just waste that won't be useful anywhere. But Nadia only turns to her ward and asks her to fulfill her request, after which Wayne apologizes and says that he said too much. He thinks that the lady can be trusted because she always has a plan. And the girl only says that she is grateful for his work, so for this trip to the capital, she is thinking of increasing his salary for his services. The man says that he will be incredibly grateful to her. He understands that, as expected, she has well-developed diplomatic skills. Wayne tells the lady that he brought one thing that he would like to give to her. The young lady says that I shouldn't, and I'm ashamed even that she's sending him to the capital again, and here's a gift. But the man claims that this is his desire, and even if she looks at least once, he will clearly like to believe her after which the servant opens the chest and a golden cloth is visible in it. The man claims that it is not easy to get him even for money, and this time he was very lucky. The main character looks at the gift and says that this is such a valuable thing. The girl understands that this is the silk that Corain could not get, which is why she tormented herself for it. Wayne only says that as soon as he saw him, he thought that he would suit my lady, so the man asks her to accept the gift as a sign of his mercy to her. The main character wants to object to something, but the Marquis comes up to her from behind and says that this silk can be used to make a dress for points, and he believes that some day she will need him, so it's better for the young lady to accept him. Wellen agrees and says that a ball gown made of fine silk would be perfect for my lady, after which the man and the servant head off in the carriage. The guy with black hair says he's interested in something, and Wayne asks what it is. Then the young man speaks of silk from the Golden Forest. The guy claims that he thought his mentor would give this thing to his lordship or senior master, but he asks why he already dedicated such a valuable thing to the lady. Well, after these words, he just gets hit on the head. The man screams that he is a fool and asks what the guy is even learning under his wing. The young man says that if he has made some mistake, he asks the teacher to let him know, and Wayne only asks who, in the young man's opinion, has the greatest power in these domains. The guy thinks a little and then says that, of course, the Marquis is in first place, the eldest gentleman is in second, and the lady is in third. Then the man says that this is wrong, and the mistress comes first. The young man asks what the teacher is talking about, and he claims that the head of the Winterfell family is the Marquis, but in fact, it is she who makes the decision. Wayne says that the young man is a merchant, but he doesn't even have that kind of savvy. In addition, the man had been watching the Marquis since childhood, but this was the first time he had such an expression on his face as today. The merchant understands that apparently their young owner has fallen in love for once. The next day, the maids admire the silk from the Golden Forest. Looking at him, one of them says that she thought she would see something like this in her entire life, and the second says that he is very handsome. The main character says that the material is beautiful, but asks if it is too luxurious for her. After all, she didn't even want to attack, so it's hardly possible to make a ball gown out of it for her. Risa remembers something and says that recently an invitation letter arrived from the royal family because a banquet will soon be held in honor of His Majesty's birthday. So the maid asks, how about making a dress for the occasion? The main character agrees and says that it will be wonderful. She thinks that she is unable to resist the royal order, so she will have to personally go to the capital for a while. But in this case, she will certainly have to see her family. The girl orders Risa to send the man to the tailors and set a time this week. The maid obeys. The main character thinks that there is no need to worry too much because she is no longer the same Nadia from the past. She then sighs and decides to continue her pending work, 
but her eyes suddenly fall on the egg. The girl turns to the maids. Three maids immediately come closer to her and ask what happened. The main character claims that she is talking about a dragon egg and asks whether there is a crack visible on it. The maids say it looks like it. And when the crack begins to widen, one of the maids screams that the baby dragon is really hatching. And the other maid screams for my lady to move away because it could be dangerous. Having learned about this news, the Marquis immediately runs as fast as he can to his wife. He thinks he was reckless. After all, I didn't think at all that the dragon egg could actually hatch. But if something dangerous happened, Nadia could get hurt. He immediately bursts into the room and cries out if the young lady is okay. The main character just looks at him calmly and asks if the guy has come. The young master asks what is in her hands, and the main character is holding a little dragon. The Marquis says that no matter how you look at it, this is a dragon child. He asks if the egg really hatched. The young lady hugs the newly hatched dragon and smiles sincerely. The main character asks Glenn if there are monsters that protect people. The guy claims that this happens very rarely, but usually the monster considers its mother the creature it first meets with its eyes after hatching. The young lady smiles and says that this little dragon takes her for his mother. She then turns to her husband and asks what the baby should be named and if Glenn has any idea. The young man says, why not just call him a dragon? Nadia refuses. She suggests omitting such names because suddenly, in the future, he will become the guardian dragon of these lands. The guy says that he doesn't even know whether he will become a guardian dragon or a disaster. It's all a matter of time. But when he reaches out to the little dragon, he becomes wary. Glenn continues to talk alive and claims that since the baby is a dragon, he still has some signs of a monster. But the black baby only bites the Marquis on the hand, causing him to scream. The main character is surprised and asks if he is okay. The guy says that she doesn't have to worry because he doesn't think there is a wound left. The young lady looks seriously at the dragon and tells him to listen, and then asks how he can attack people and says that if he behaves like this, then she will not be able to raise him. The girl claims that she will have nothing to say if rumors immediately kick him out of there for attacking their master. The kid just looks at the young lady with sad eyes. The head coach says that making such beautiful eyes will not help. The Marquis is a little embarrassed. He thinks that everything about his wife seems nice. But the young lady then turns to him and asks what about Noah? And then he adds that this will be the name of this baby. A little time later, the main character is already walking around the garden and looking for her little dragon. The girl wonders where he disappeared again, and probably everything is interesting to him since the baby was born not so long ago. The first place the main character visits is the kitchen. One of the maids asks what business Milady came for. The young lady says she thought Noah would be there. Recently, a girl read a book about dragons, so she learned that young dragons tend to consider closed places safe. And they have to eat a lot to grow, so Nadia visited the kitchen, and suddenly she heard some rustling. It comes from the doors in the locker, so the main character approaches it and opens it. And inside, he sees a little dragon who is eating cookies with might and mane. The main character picks him up and says that he is such a brat, because the baby should have asked her for food if he was hungry. The little dragon just looks at her innocently, and the lady with brown hair thinks how cute it is. The maid says that, by the way, the master also often looked there as a child. The young lady asks if this is true about the maids. She says yes, and he did it at the height of his growth. The guy grew up every night, and even after eating he remained hungry, so whenever he found an opportunity, he always ran to the kitchen. Nadia says that it's surprising that such an impassive Glenn had such a period. The girl thinks that he must have been so sweet. And then he says that the little dragon looks like Glenn, in response to which the baby just smiles. A little time later, the main character is sitting at the documents. The Marquis claims that lately the baby has been wandering around, turning the entire mansion upside down and asks if this is true. The young lady just smiles. She constantly tried to find the missing Noah. One of the servants asked why my lady was there, and the girl was just looking for the baby. A little time later, the dragon hid again, and at that time, already in the garden, the gardener asked why my lady had come to such an unkempt place. Now Nadia says that Noah is just very curious, and besides, he hasn't done anything serious yet, and also listens to her well. The Marquis looks at these two and thinks that maybe the dragon just does what he listens to, but the fact is that he is an obstacle in the relationship between him and Nadia. He puts the sheet on the table and says that he thinks he will have to be separated from this cub for a while. The main character takes the sheet in her hands and asks what it is, and the Marquis says that it is an invitation letter sent by the royal family. He believes that this is in honor of the king's birthday, and they will need to prepare to move to the capital.
The young lady is not very happy about this news. She thinks that everything is as expected. Glenn asks if her plans to create a cure from the remains of monsters are still valid. Nadia says that this, of course, is true, and even their effect has already been proven, so she plans to start trading in the capital. The girl asks if he still doesn't believe in this, and her husband says that that's not the case and he's just a little worried, because as she knows, nobles don't engage in trade very often, so such people are usually looked down upon. Nadia asks Glenn if he is worried that she will be neglected in the capital. She then thanks him for his concern, but says that she has everything planned, so he shouldn't worry because he will see and understand everything himself. The guy says that he will say, just in case, that if everything does not turn out as she expected, then he asks not to torture herself because no one in their family will dare to blame her. The young lady agrees. She wonders if Glenn has really become so affectionate. She can't believe that this is the same person she saw when she first met. She also asks her husband not to worry about her and then looks at him. And she claims that they must continue to accumulate strength because from now on she decides to start taking active action. That evening, Lee Ji Ho also receives a letter, a video of which he smiles because soon he will be able to see Nadia again.